All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Fully Inflated Football video podcast. I am your host, Marcus Whitman, and we have a really exciting show ahead of us today. We're going to be doing a deep dive into the upcoming coaching carousel, predicting who's going to be coaching where, ranking the coach openings, ranking the coaching candidates. It's going to be a deep dive into the coaching carousel. And then we're going to do our weekly recap from a game by game perspective and get into the Patreon mailbag. I do want to remind you guys before we get started that this show is brought to you by my Patreon. That is patreon.com slash that franchise guy, where you can not just support the show, but become a part of it by gaining access to the Patreon mailbag where I answer your questions on the show. But not just that, you will also get exclusive TFG content, things like my weekly NFL picks videos my full comprehensive NFL draft board just around the corner. We're like three weeks from draft season starting here, so that's exciting. And then at the highest level there on Patreon, you'll get the full Draft Insider package. Great time to sign up with the draft around the corner. We're going to be doing film breakdowns, all the quarterbacks for sure. We're going to be doing top players at each position as we get closer to the draft. And you'll get access to team-specific seven-round mock drafts starting in March. So the full TFG Draft Insider package there on Patreon. Even beyond that, you'll get access to any other film breakdowns I do there. Just did yesterday a Justin Herbert against Buffalo film breakdown. So like I said, a great time to sign up on patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Support the show, get exclusive content. Uh, So please do consider going over there to check it out. All right, let's get into the, the main topic for the show here, the coaching carousel deep dive. So we're going to have some different parts of this here. We're going to start by talking about what the openings are and some other teams that might have some coach openings. And then we're going to rank all of those spots. At the end of the day, I'm going to have 10 teams that either will for sure or could potentially have openings. So we're going to rank kind of the desirability of those openings. Then we'll get into the candidates themselves. I have 17 guys on my list, some much more important than others. And then at the end of it, I'm going to predict where everyone's coaching, who's coaching who, basically, uh, and what are the best fits team-wise. So starting with the actual openings themselves, there's six teams that are, in my mind, for sure. One of them is still to be for sure left open, but these ones are pretty safe to me that will be looking for new head coaches. So you got the Jets, Adam Gase is gone, like he's just there to lose and get Trevor Lawrence. The Jags, I think almost certainly you move on from Doug Marone there. And then you've got the Chargers with Anthony Lynn. So those three teams have yet to fire their head coaches, but I think that come Black Monday, which is the first day after week 17, we'll see those three job openings open up almost at a 99% assured rate. Then you got the Falcons, Texans, and Lions who have already fired their head coaches and begun the search. And then you've got four teams that I think could get in the mix here, either teams that could do better at coach or just teams that are having really bad coaching seasons, but guys that have had historic success. So you've got the Bengals on this list for me. I'm just not that impressed by Zach Taylor. I mean, there's really not much else to say other than that. They have not shown a lot of development as a team. They don't really have a team identity. This is the end of year two, and they are just not a good football team under him. So I'm just not impressed. I think when Joe Burrow is your coach, you can do a hell of a lot better than Zach Taylor. That just doesn't have a whole lot of desirable traits as a head coach to me. Then you get the Cowboys and Eagles, Doug Peterson, Mike McCarthy, two teams in the NFC East, obviously have some crazy expectations for these two franchises. And both these coaches are are having two of the worst coaching seasons of the year. So I, I really think that those two should come open. But from the Eagles perspective, will they be too stubborn to the fact that Doug Peterson technically won a Super Bowl like four years ago? The Cowboys, will they be stubborn? Jerry Jones tends to have a lot of loyalty to a fault a lot of the times. So those are definitely questionable, but we will talk about what could happen if those become available. And then the Chicago Bears with... Uh, coach, oh man, drawing a blank here, Matt Nagy. 
had some success. He's had to work with Mitch Trubisky and Nick Foles. How do they view that spot? How uh, you know? How much could they actually upgrade at head coach? Depending on you know, are they gonna be able to reel in the top candidates over guys like the Jets who are gonna have Trevor Lawrence, the Chargers who have that quarterback figured out with Herbert, the Texans, Falcons who have quarterbacks in place? Is it realistic for them to be able to upgrade over Matt Nagy, even if you aren't like? super excited about bringing him back so they they are definitely a team that i think will be thinking about firing their coach but i I don't i don't know if that's with any certainty at all so that's 10 potential openings and now i'm going to rank them as far as far as desirability and this is going to be if they became available and desirability is obviously a subjective look at this here but you got to factor in the state of the roster draft picks who's the quarterback What's your cap space? All that stuff. And then you got to look at ownership. Are they going to have your back? Are they going to, you know, fund you in the way that you need to win a championship? Uh, and then you've got like, where's the team located? You'd much rather live in Chicago or New York as opposed to say Jacksonville for most people. Uh, and yeah, there's just a lot of different things that factor into this here. But the first one to me, if it became available the most desirable landing spot for a new head coach would be the Cincinnati Bengals because of Joe Burrow. You get to sign up to work with that man at quarterback who has an incredibly bright future. And I think that would appeal to any prospective coach out there. Uh, So to me, the Bengals are number one simply because of Joe Burrow there. And if that became available, it would be because they're saying, we don't hate our head coach, but we really think you can be our guy. We're going to have your back. And in this world, that's a world where the Bengals' ownership is getting their act together and admitting that, yeah, we've got Joe Burrow, so let's go get a head coach to match the caliber of quarterback that we have just drafted. Let's fix this offensive line and let's get to work. So in this world, that's desirable. But we'll get into our predictions. I don't think that they'll actually do that because the Bengals almost never do the right thing. So Bengals would be number one if it became available. Then number two to me would be the Dallas Cowboys. Now, you've got Dak coming back from that injury situation. You don't have a lot of cap flexibility, but team prestige obviously is a big deal. Being the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys just sounds a lot better for your own whatever than being the head coach of the Detroit Lions or the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's that simple, but they also have the quarterback in place. You have an owner that is going to be very loyal to you. Now, is Jerry Jones going to admit his problem here and get rid of Mike McCarthy because he is so loyal? We'll see. But you've got a great receiving core. You've got some pieces on defense to hopefully build that unit back up. And you can get this team back to glory pretty quickly, in my opinion, with the amount of talent on this roster, with the offensive line coming back healthy next year. So the Cowboys would be second. Then I have the Houston Texans third. And a lot of people won't agree with this because... It's easy to say they have no cap space. They have no draft picks. Why would you want that position? They have so much work to do with the roster. Well, if you're a a top end coach, you're going to put a priority on getting to work with Deshaun Watson over one year of difficult team building. You know, you could come in, you could win 10, 11 games with Deshaun Watson immediately. He is playing pretty clearly as at worst, the fourth best quarterback in football right now. And they have pieces, they've got receivers, the offensive line's been better, and you get through the tough you know, layover from what, what Bill O'Brien did to the roster as far as draft picks and cap space, but all of a sudden, you can build this thing up very quickly with the quarterback like Deshaun Watson, who just got extended here. He's not going anywhere. So the Texans to me third, then the New York Jets fourth. The main reason they aren't number one is because of the ownership for the Jets, This is just not an organization that you would really be that excited to run in and try to fix everything here because top down, they clearly have issues and that would be a whole nother topic, but that just speaks for itself. Uh, They can't seem to do anything right here for the Jets, but that said, you very likely will have Trevor Lawrence and this is contingent on them getting the number one overall pick and finishing the tank here. Uh, if, if not, then you would, you would bump the Jags up on this list. Uh, but getting Trevor Lawrence, all, all the same reasons we've talked about, like you'll notice the trend here. These top four teams, you got Joe Burrow, you got Dak Prescott for the Dallas Cowboys, and you got Deshaun Watson. With the Jets, 
you would have Trevor Lawrence. You get to move Sam Darnold, hopefully get a pick there. You have lots of draft capital uh, for the Jamal Adams trade. So the Jets, to me, number four, definitely just from a roster point of view, probably the number one most intriguing, high upside approach. And they could really go places with a legitimate culture and coach. Then the Chargers at number five, and it's all about Justin Herbert here, although they do have other talent. You got Bosa, you hopefully have Derwin James coming back. You got some great receivers. You have a really nice roster to work with here. But again, you have some ownership issues, really just you know, Spanos and these guys, they're just cheap. Like, will they always have your back to make the moves you need to move, make to, to win a championship? I don't know. But they have a great front office. They scout well. You have Herbert, who is very promising as a quarterback. I won't get into Herbert in, in this segment, but it looks like you at least have a, a Matthew Stafford to, I don't know, Jared Goff range of like a good quarterback there, if not more. So the Chargers are fifth. And then... Uh, we get into some of these maybe openings. So the Eagles, if they were to become available, I, I would put them there. Now it's it's a little iffy, but I think you at least have an ownership that like really wants to win and they're gonna make some of those aggressive moves and kind of you know have your back. I keep saying that, but I think it's a big deal to have an ownership that wants to work with you and share a vision with you. I think the Eagles would be a spot where they can do that. Now, you've got some cap problems. You'd have to get really creative from a team-building perspective. And then you have this disaster of the quarterback situation of, do you try to fix Carson Wentz with that massive contract? Do you trade him? What is Jalen Hurts? But in theory, they should have a pretty good pick here. Like, they should have, like, a top-five pick. Worst case, you could even draft a new quarterback. Like, you're going to have some flexibility here uh, in, in some aspects of the roster construction. So... I think they absolutely should fire Doug Peterson. He's done a miserable job with this Eagles team over the last two years. I don't know if they will. We'll talk about that in the prediction segment. Uh, But yeah, the Eagles sixth. Then the Bears seventh. Very similar to the Eagles. You've got an older team ready to win right now. But the Eagles at least have some bodies in there at quarterback. Whereas the Bears, it's like you have no idea what you're getting with the quarterback. Um, But again, you have the prestige of the Chicago Bears. That would be nice. But from a roster building standpoint, it's a mess. Like you have an old defense that is inevitably going to regress and a terrible offensive line that's only getting older and no answers at quarterback. So you've got some pretty big roster stuff to figure out there, but I'd still rather move to Chicago and be the head coach of the Chicago Bears than my next three teams that quite frankly are just lower here because of team prestige and excitement for going to coach for these teams. That starts with the Jacksonville Jaguars who... You know, you're probably going to end up with Justin Fields, most likely, or whoever your number two quarterback is coming in, uh, which is fun and exciting, but you got some work to do on the roster. The defense has basically been torn to shreds. You got to build that up. Offensively, you do have some playmakers to work with. uh, But again, the Jacksonville Jaguars, not exactly a prestigious organization. And then, honestly, pretty similar with like the Falcons and the Lions here, the next two teams. Falcon spot is just kind of fine. It's kind of bland. You get Matt Ryan, who's going to be 36. You have an, a 32-year-old Julio Jones. You don't have a lot of cap space. Like, it's just kind of whatever. I I don't think it'd be the worst place to go. That, to me, is the Detroit Lions, who just... It seems like everything this organization touches just, just lights on fire. Like, it just turns to crap. And I don't know if I want anything to do with that organization if I can go to any of these other spots. You do have Stafford... He's starting to get called a coach killer because of a lack of consistency. I don't really think it's it's his fault. I think as a coach, I would like to work with Matthew Stafford. But man, this team, this organization just for 20 plus years has not been able to do anything right. And it, it's just kind of a mess there with Detroit. And I just don't feel confident that if I took that job, that I would get the help around me to, you know, be there in three years. And it just feels like whoever they hire, it's it's finding out who they're going to fire in 2023, basically. Uh, so there's the list of desirability. Now let's talk about the coaches themselves. So I have 17 players here. Uh, seven of them are more honorable mentions, so I won't go into them in depth, um, but these are ranked. So 17 through 11, Keith Butler, defensive coordinator for the Steelers, speaks for itself. Todd Bowles, defensive coordinator for the Cardinals. I like him a lot. Uh, He did a decent job with the Jets as head coach there. So could he get a retread opportunity? Lincoln Riley, if he wanted to be an NFL coach, he he would be 
potentially number one on this list. That's the massive question with him is can you lure him out of Oklahoma and really give him enough money and runway and a prestigious organization where he would want to leave Oklahoma. So that's ranked lower for that reason. Jim Harbaugh, eh, eh, (laughs) I'll just leave it at that. Josh McDaniels, offensive coordinator for the Patriots, who has been kind of flirted for an offense uh, for another head coaching opportunity for years. Gary Kubiak is doing a really good job for the Minnesota Vikings. We're going to talk about him later in the show, a former head coach. Uh, And then Matt Nagy, if he gets fired, is there a team that looks at what he did in Chicago and say, we give him a better quarterback. We think he, he has the leadership traits as a head coach and the, the scheme to work in the NFL. Um, But then the top 10 here, who I'll talk a little bit more in depth. So Brandon Staley, a name that is emerging lately, the defensive coordinator for the Rams. I don't think he's got the resume quite yet to be considered for a head coaching position, but the job he's done with that Rams defense has been a great job. Uh, They made a kind of a bold move going to him. And Sean McVay, he knows how to hire staff. And they moved on from uh, Wade Phillips, the the old defensive coordinator there. And they made kind of a bold move going to Brandon Staley. And he has rejuvenated that Rams defense. He's doing such a good job putting guys in places to succeed, guys that you wouldn't expect. Uh, You got guys like, um, man, uh, the Darius Williams, the the five foot nine corner playing outside for them. The, these young safeties are stepping up. The linebackers, guys on that uh, front seven, guys like Sebastian Joseph Day getting put in great spots to succeed and just well rounding that defense. So he's making an early case for himself. Probably not quite yet going to get that job. You got Mike McDaniel. He is the next Shanahan guy, basically. So he is the offensive coordinator, the run game coordinator under Kyle Shanahan. He's young. He's 37 years old. Looks a little funky. Would probably need a haircut if he's going to get serious consideration um, for a head coach. Um, But, you know, I didn't think Matt Patricia looked like a head coach either, I suppose. But, um, yeah, Mike McDaniel is a name we're going to start hearing uh, based on how good that run game has been there for Kyle Shanahan and kind of how successful that scheme has been being replicated around the league, places like Tennessee, Green Bay, Minnesota, Cleveland, very popular scheme with that play action outside zone scheme. Then you got Ryan Day, does make my top 10 list. He's the head coach at Ohio State. Under the radar has been one of the just best coaches in in the whole world uh, as far as football is concerned. They just dominate week in, week out. And I don't know how you wouldn't be attracted to what he's showing, uh, stepping in for Urban Meyer and just not missing a beat there. So if he wanted to take that step to the NFL, uh, a guy that came from San Francisco, I believe, when he went to Ohio State. So he's done a phenomenal job. He's a guy that I think uh, should be discussed for the NFL. Um, And then Jay Gruden is number seven on my list. I'm really impressed with what he's done in Jacksonville I thought he got kind of a bad beat in Washington. He was there kind of at the peak of all of the organizational dysfunction, and maybe he's to blame for some of that, but uh, the roster really got ripped to shreds, and he was doing a great job. You got to keep in mind, Jay Gruden in like 2015 with Kirk Cousins had quite possibly the best offense in the league, and he's doing a great job with three different quarterbacks in Jacksonville, really quietly. So I think Jay Gruden is making a case to be a head coach again sooner rather than later. Then you got the two defensive minded guys, Robert Sala, Matt Eberflus, very similar candidates. Robert Sala, a little more of a hoorah guy, uh, whereas Eberflus, I would look at as a more calculated uh, uh, schematics first kind of defensive coordinator, but both very good, just solid options. If you want to go the defensive coordinator as your head coach route, I'm much lower on those types of hires in general. Sure, you see them work out if they can do a great job hiring the offensive coordinator, but we've seen it year after year after year, where if you have a defensive head coach, you're inevitably, if you're good, going to hire a good offensive coordinator, and then they're going to get a head coach job somewhere else, and you're going to be sitting back like the Atlanta with Dan Quinn. We've seen it in other spots where you're sitting back like, yeah, we got a solid coach here, but man, I would love to have our offensive coordinator back because at the end of the day, it's an offensive league and he really made things click for us. So if you want to fix your defense, Robert Sale and Matt Eberflus are the two names that you want to go for. 
But that's the question is, do you want to hire a defensive coach over an offensive coach? Um, then we have Eric Bieniemy. He's going to be my fourth guy here. And, you know, I don't have anything against Eric Bieniemy. It's just, I think the other guys on the top three have kind of done more for themselves. The thing with Eric Bieniemy is it's so, so difficult to, di- to, to take what he's doing and pull it apart from working under Andy Reid, who is a creative genius. So it's hard to know how much of the innovation in there is Andy Reid and how much is Eric Bieniemy. So there's just unknown there. And then you also have, um, uh, what was it? Oh, wait, he, he's working with Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey. Like he's not going to have that where else he goes. So how much are those guys elevating Eric Bieniemy? I think he's a great head coach candidate. I do think he gets a head coaching job, um, but I'm not like most people who have him as my number one. I actually have three guys that would be to me higher because they've shown more ability on their own without a guy above them to have a ton of success. And and to me, that's what you're looking for in a head coach is what are you going to bring to us when you're ripped out from the guys above you? And there's just much more unknown with Eric Bieniemy, And the Andy Reid disciples haven't really done much for us. Matt Nagy and Doug Peterson, bottom 10 head coaches in the league. So I don't know. There's just some unknowns there with Eric Bieniemy. I still think he's a good head coach candidate. Um, but my next guy is going to be Arthur Smith, uh, the offensive coordinator for the Tennessee Titans, who's just been incredible. Uh, he, he stepped right in after Matt LaFleur, kept the same scheme. So he's under the, you know, Shanahan, LaFleur, and then Arthur Smith, I guess, is the tree. But he's going to run that Shanahan scheme. And I, I got to take back what I said about Mike McDaniel as the guy you're hiring if you want that Shanahan scheme because it's, it's Arthur Smith first. But if you aren't going to get Arthur Smith, who's definitely going to be one of the top three names this offseason, if you aren't going to get him and you still want to run that scheme, then you might think about Mike McDaniel. Uh, But anyway, Arthur Smith has just done a phenomenal job with Tennessee. The revival of Ryan Ryan Tannehill, utilizing A.J. Brown and and Jonu Smith and Derrick Henry so perfectly in that scheme. Uh, So a little more kind of roster specific with Arthur Smith. You know, you'd want to hire him in a position where you know that you can run outside zone, have an athletic offensive line, have a running back that can get the edge, and then have guys that are really good athletes at wide receiver to run crossing routes. It's a pretty specific scheme, but if you can put him in the right spot and you want a quarterback that can let it let it go. Um, So, uh, yeah, Arthur Smith, third, not going to get much disagreement there. And then number two, a little bit risky here, but Joe Brady, who's done just such a outstanding job he's been one of the best offensive coordinators wherever he's gone over the last two years and again he's done it by himself so he goes to LSU after getting hired from New Orleans so he is under the uh, Sean Payton coaching tree Um, but he goes to LSU wins a national championship lights up the world becomes the talk of the town but he's like 31 years old 32 years old so you're looking at like Sean McVay basically uh, but then the Panthers have an eye for him. They say, you're, you're going to be our offense coordinator. So they hire him. He clearly has the ambition to be a head coach. You don't go uh, from doing what you did at LSU one year to then go to the NFL. If you don't have that mindset of, I'm going to be an NFL head coach, I don't think. Um, so Joe Brady, to me, it would be a risky thing because he's younger. But Sean McVay was the same risk. And I think Joe Brady... We'll talk about one specific team that would be a slam dunk hire in just a second. Um, But my number one candidate is Brian Dable. Uh, I I will just refer you back to my Week 10 Reactions podcast. Go to the Buffalo Bills portion of that podcast. But basically, his resume is awesome. He's worked under Saban, Belichick. He's been in the league for a long time. And most importantly, what he's done, again, on his own there as the offensive coordinator in Buffalo with Josh Allen is truly remarkable. This is one of the best quarterback development jobs we've ever seen as far as working on accuracy, slowing the game down, getting guys to see the field better, getting them comfortable in an offense. Brian Dable, if the ultimate goal in in the NFL is to get a quarterback to play his best football, Brian Dable has the best candidate, uh, is the best candidate for getting that to happen for your quarterback. So that's my list of candidates. Now let's go back to that one through 10 desirable coaching availabilities. And I'm just going to predict 
what I think happens here. So with the Cincinnati Bengals at number one, I'm going to predict that they are good old conservative Bengals and they do not fire Zach Taylor, which I think they should fire Zach Taylor if they can get Joe Brady to come to Cincinnati because Joe Brady, man, get him back with Joe Burrow, enough said. Uh, So it would be way too much. And, And he's maybe the only candidate that you're really excited to do that. You know, if you're looking at some of these other guys, I don't know if they're the best candidates to 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 really elevate you from Zach Taylor. But Joe Brady is that slam dunk, like swing for the fences higher that the Bengals need. Um, ultimately, they probably don't fire Zach Taylor. They come back next year, they're fine. And then maybe they fire Zach Taylor next year and get the best coach next year. But that's just kind of my prediction is Joe Brady or bust and most likely nobody no change here for the Bengals who just like we said their ownership is just too conservative then we got the Dallas Cowboys now as loyal as Jerry Jones is I do think they fire Mike McCarthy the job he's done is inexcusable it's frankly deplorable everywhere he goes the defense just forgets how to football and the offense has no identity and it's 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 the Packers all over again I mean this guy would not This guy would have been out of the league five years ago if he didn't have the luck to coach Aaron Rodgers for as long as he did. So, um, you know, I I just think you you cannot look at what he's done and say that this is an NFL head coach and you fire Mike McCarthy. And I know it's it's been talked about before, but I'm actually going to go out on a limb here and predict that it finally happens. Lincoln Riley to the Dallas Cowboys. I think that if he's going to do it, it now is the time. Dallas Cowboys, Lincoln Riley, it just it's just a match made in heaven. Now, I don't know if he has that ambition. He's clearly a guy that's been thrown out in the conversations before, and he's passed him up. But I don't know if Dallas called him last year or what the deal was there. They seem pretty set on going the Mike McCarthy route all along. So now that that's kind of done, do we see Lincoln Riley uh, as more of a local hire? Kind of would be the, now you, you got some, you know, Texas fans... Oklahoma, you got some things to sort out there, but I think it just makes sense. Young offensive mind to work with Dak Prescott, these receivers, reunite him with CD Lamb now that he's in the building. I just think if you're going to do it, Lincoln Riley, do it now because Dallas is eventually going to find a coach that they like and he's going to be there for a long time. So I, it just makes too much sense for me. And I'm actually going to predict that that will happen. And then the Houston Texans at number three. As much as I like Brian Dable, I think Eric Bieniemy is the fit here for Houston. You just look at the talent of Deshaun Watson. We talked about that being something that kind of has been just a question mark for Eric Bieniemy. Is what's he going to look like without an elite quarterback? Well, let's just let him work with Deshaun Watson. You can do a lot of the creative stuff with the um, with just everything they do is so creative in Kansas City. It's hard to even know where to start, but a lot of it depends on the mobility. Uh, and ability for Patrick Mahomes to play point guard on a lot of these misdirections and all that stuff. So that's just a base starting point for Watson. But then you also have a lot of speed at receiver in Houston. It just makes sense schematically for Eric Bieniemy to enter his comfort zone and basically try to replicate what he did in Kansas City. Uh, so I, I like that. That's going to be my prediction. Um, and then for the Jets at uh, with the fourth team here, Brian Babel, uh, staying in the AFC East, you steal him from Buffalo, strong-armed young quarterback in Trevor Lawrence, and you can get him to do the same thing you did with Josh Allen. Uh, Just makes too much sense. This is probably the most surefire prediction here. I'd be pretty stunned if Brian Dable is not the head coach of the Jets. It'd be a pretty big mistake for the Jets to not try and um, basically steal Brian Dable away here. Uh, So there's the prediction there. Uh, Brian Dable will have then coached for every team in the AFC East. He's a guy that knows some of the ins and outs of how Belichick operates. That's going to play to a benefit. He obviously knows how the Bills operate. So that's an underrated aspect of hiring a guy in a division is he's going to have a lot of that inside knowledge and give you a leg up on some of those big games. Uh, So Brian Dable to the Jets is my prediction there. And then for the Chargers, I'm going to predict Arthur Smith, the Titans offensive coordinator, 
Herbert is a better version of Ryan Tannehill. You get him on the move. He can let it go. He throws the ball on the run, outside of the pocket, on play action, as good as anyone. Get him in his comfort zone. As great as Herbert's been, I still think he's a quarterback, at least at this stage in his career, where you want to make everything as easy on him as possible. Scheme up big hitting plays in the passing game and make the offensive line better by creating moving pockets in play action. It is the perfect fit as far as the quarterback himself with Justin Herbert. And then you have some receivers that may or may not be perfect for what they want to do as far as having that speed and run after catch ability. But I think they would make it work. Maybe you let Mike Williams go. I will say Joe Reed, really intriguing in this type of offense. I compared him to Debo Samuel. So he could be that A.J. Brown role as the guy that runs crossing routes. You scheme him open and he shows that run after the catch ability. Uh, So, yeah, I like Arthur Smith to the Chargers. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Then you got Philadelphia. I'm going to predict no fire here. I think they're going to be stubborn to Doug Peterson, basically making the same mistake that the the Packers made with Mike McCarthy for too long, saying, well, he won us a Super Bowl. Let's give him another chance here. I'm going to predict no fire for the Philadelphia Eagles, though I absolutely think they should fire Doug Peterson. Uh, And if they do, where do you go? That's a little more iffy, especially if all of these other guys are gone. If you could get Brian Dable here or Arthur Smith, that would be ideal. I don't think you go with Eric Bieniemy again because you already just failed with a Andy Reid disciple. You're just kind of repeating the same mistake, I think, if you do that. Um, But, you know, if you could get Dable or Arthur Smith, that might make that decision a little easier. Options for them at this point, I, I think you go with more cultural leaders. So I'm looking at maybe you could lure Ryan Day out of Ohio State or Gary Kubiak from the Minnesota Vikings, a former head coach, a little older, but might be the right guy to be kind of a bridge coach to reestablish some consistency here. Maybe he sets the tone. Maybe you have a, a young coordinator that works under Kubiak and you could hire from within and just kind of get some culture back here in Philadelphia. Uh, but that's a little more difficult to know. Like, who you could get, where you go there. But I don't think Doug Peterson is the answer either way. Then for Chicago, I'm going to predict no fire here. I think they stand by... um, Why why am I struggling with this name today? Matt Nagy. I think they stand by him for one more year. But that's going to hurt Bears fans to hear because they're very anti-Nagy. I just... He's had to work with such bad quarterbacks. And in this world, you're just not getting those top candidates. So I don't know if you're necessarily upgrading... But if they did fire someone, I would hire either Matt Eberflus or Robert Sala, get this defense back to the elite version of itself, and just try to run it back. Maybe you sign a, I don't know, who, not Jameis, but an Alex Smith. Maybe Rivers becomes available, something like that. You sign a veteran that is better for you. You get back to elite defense and just try to run this thing back as a good team. It's not ideal, but I don't think the Bears also are, are a, an ownership that's going to like do the full teardown project and like swing for the fences hiring like Lincoln Riley or Joe Brady or something like that. Uh, who, by the way, Joe Brady has not been hired yet. Uh, it, it takes a certain risk-taking organization to do that, and maybe Philadelphia would do that. But um, anyway, the Jacksonville Jaguars... I, I think they stick with Jay Gruden. I think they they promote Jay Gruden internally. He's done a phenomenal job. The, the players clearly play hard for him. So you get Fields in there. You have great receivers. You get to keep the scheme the same and just plug Justin Fields into it. And I think that's probably the best case for the Jags because, again, they're just not the most desirable head coach opening. But Jay Gruden, I think that's my prediction there. They stick with him. The Atlanta Falcons... I'm going to predict Josh McDaniels. It's kind of a bland hire for the Falcons. At least it's an offensive guy. The best thing you can say here is that McDaniels is going to be very comfortable coaching Matt Ryan. Can get back to what he is comfortable with, with the quick hitting option passing game. And you get to work with one of the smarter quarterbacks in the league in Matt Ryan. And maybe this could work out as a retread head coach. And then the Detroit Lions... My prediction is going to be either Robert Salet or Matt Eberflus. Hard to know exactly who they would go with there, but I've talked about Detroit needing a Jimmy's and a Joe's coach, not an X's and an O's coach. 
they tried to do the X's and the O's thing with Matt Patricia, and it just didn't work out. And the organization is just in free fall right now. So give me a guy that is going to come in and create some excitement as a guy that has not been a head coach before, but get a guy that can get the organization on the same page, play more physical, at least get a good defense back. You can keep um, their offensive coordinator who's stepping up as, as the uh, interim head coach. His name's escaping me, Daryl Bevel. You can keep him in there. He's fine as an offensive coordinator. And you keep that continuity with Stafford and then just get this defense working. The one thing I will say is that both Sala and Eberflus are going to run a lot of zone coverage. That's going to be a little rough with Akuda, who is much more of a man corner. And you just spent the number three pick on Akuda, so you want to kind of make sure he's in a, in a place to succeed. He would have to learn to be more of that Richard Sherman press cover three corner in either of these schemes. But I think he could do it. He's a really smart physical player. And at the end of the day, it might be best for him because he doesn't have elite long speed and he has, he is struggling in, in man coverage at the next level. So maybe it does work out for Akuta and I'm talking myself into it. Uh, but yeah, there's your coaching carousel deep dive. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break and then we're going to get into the uh, game by game breakdowns here. Uh, so we'll be right back. All right, on to the game-by-game recaps. We're going to start with the Giants-Seahawks game. This was, to me, the most intriguing game of the week. Obviously, a huge upset with the Giants taking down the Seahawks. So that that was a big deal. I mean, Seattle is kind of reeling right now. And I'm going to be honest, if they had to play this Giants team week one, they would be in trouble. This was a tough matchup for the Seahawks for a lot of different reasons. So... I really respect what the Giants are doing right now. They've been this way all year. They've been a tough, disciplined, specifically defense. They're still weeding out some stuff on the offensive side of the ball for sure. But this defense is really impressive, and they have been a huge, pleasant surprise to me. I thought they'd be one of the worst in the league. Really didn't know what to expect here with Joe Judge. It was kind of a random hire, but clearly he's got these guys playing physical. Uh, And then you got the defense coordinator, Patrick Graham, doing a great job here. But yeah, let's talk about what the Giants did here to neutralize Seattle, because that was one of the stories of the week, was the Giants came up with an excellent game plan to really neutralize the Seahawks' offense, and it was a lot of matchup stuff that was just really cool to see. So they had a conservative game plan. They played a ton of off coverage, and they did the typical classic Bill Belichick philosophy. So you have Joe Judge, a former Belichick guy, and they had the Belichick philosophy at the core of what Belichick does is how are you going to beat me? How do you like to beat teams? We're going to take that away. And so they did that this week. They put Bradbury on DK Metcalf all day and they backed him off. They said, you're going to play seven plus yards off of DK Metcalf. And we're not going to let Metcalf catch the ball over the top and have these backbreaking 60 yard plays that demoralize our whole defense. And, And they basically forced Seattle to beat you in other ways and they couldn't do it. And it was really impressive. And they also paired that with a really nice game plan as far as, okay, we're not just going to let, we're we're not going to just stop you from hitting DK Metcalf. We're also going to stop Russell Wilson from getting out of the pocket. And pretty much every second and third down, they put these athletic edge players out there. So you had Carter Coughlin, Cam Brown, and they even put Tay Crowder a bunch on the edge in this outside linebacker edge position. And they weren't even asking them to really rush the passer most of the time. They were basically saying, just hang out on the edge and play contain. And they did a great job. Carter Coughlin was awesome in this game. I'm a big Carter Coughlin fan, especially used like this as a guy that can catch up to Russell Wilson with that speed on the edge. And then they paired that by just creating interior pressure and making Russell Wilson uncomfortable, whether it was blitzing or leaning on guys like Leonard Williams to come inside. Leonard Williams played a lot of edge this week, by the way, and played great. Uh, But they have a really good matchup here because they have the bodies on the inside with, with, with Williams and Dexter Lawrence and Dalvin Tomlinson. They can, they can pressure you up the middle with these guys and they blitzed up the middle very consistently. And that combination forced Russ outside, and then you have really quick contain guys who you weren't even asking to get pressure from the edge, and Russ just got lost. He started panicking. He played uncomfortable. He stopped playing in rhythm because he was so worried about the fact that he didn't have that crutch of, if things go wrong here, I can get out of the pocket. And you could see, third, fourth quarter, 
he he was not comfortable as a passer and and that's Russell's biggest weakness is playing in rhythm uh forcing you know you know taking what is there that is what's to me pushed at this point Russell behind Aaron Rodgers in the quarterback rankings because yeah he does these phenomenal things and if the defense lets you do them he's gonna look like the best quarterback in the league but if you take away his ability to get outside the pocket and launch balls to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett down the field who are getting open because they're trying to play press coverage on these guys then yeah Russ is going to be phenomenal but if you come in with this game plan where you're literally saying you're going to have to beat us some other way other than getting out of the pocket and launching moon balls to DK Metcalf and they couldn't do it so great game plan from the Giants it'll be very interesting to see a if other teams replicate this game plan because it's pretty easy to replicate this thing if you've got one or two guys on that D line that can get pressure you blitz a linebacker, you, you mix some things up, you disguise some coverages, and you got to get a little creative on that front. But at the end of the day, if you put really athletic guys, and you can even do what the Giants did. Tay Crowder is not an edge player. He's a middle linebacker, but they, they line him up at edge outside linebacker and just had him play contain. You need speed to catch Russell Wilson, but they don't need to be able to rush the passer because you're not asking them to rush the passer. So if you replicate this game plan, no matter what your scheme is, I think you can beat the Seahawks and you know Bradbury did a good job on DK Metcalf as far as keeping him underneath but I don't think you need necessarily Bradbury or Jalen Ramsey or Stephon Gilmore to replicate this you do need a a bigger corner because at the end of the day if you're putting a five foot ten corner on DK Metcalf he's still gonna out physical you uh, at some point one or another but yeah I mean this was just a great game plan by Patrick Graham and the Giants uh, and, and they just did enough to get this job done. So you're you're definitely worried about the one-dimensional aspect of Seattle. The offensive line becoming a pretty major concern for Seattle. Uh, they had to go to another backup at right tackle who was just getting obliterated in this game. Uh, so you've got some issues with Seattle right now. I still think they'll be okay. Uh, I don't know if they're the best team in the NFC at this point, but I'm not going to overreact to Seattle's loss here. I think they'll be all right. They get to play the Jets this week, so a nice kind of week to rinse and wash out this loss and gain some momentum heading into the back end of the season Uh, so let's move on to the cleveland tennessee game that was real exciting uh for the browns not so much for the titans for the titans there's really not much to add here they will lose games like this we've talked about how they're kind of a boomer bust team if you force them to get off of the script of the outside zone running being able to set the tone with derrick henry and then you Um, spin play action off of that you hit AJ Brown and let them get those big plays in the passing game that's what they want to do Uh, but if you force them off of that script Ryan Tannehill these guys they're not going to be particularly comfortable and the Titans defense is becoming a problem so you pair those together and they're a they're a boomer bust team on a week-to-week basis and that's not really changing their upside on a weekly basis is still really nice but their downside is pretty big as well clearly Uh, So for the Browns, this is much more exciting. And I talked about Kevin Stefanski in the power rankings. He's he's just doing such a phenomenal job. The Browns finally hit on a head coach. And there's there's so many things you could say about him. The scheme is great. He is mostly a Shanahan Kubiak guy. Most of the stuff they do is either outside zone or duo up the middle just lots of zone blocking and then they stem play action off of it it's same scheme here with Tennessee but Stefanski has been around under a bunch of different offensive coordinators he has some different ideas that he'll mix in there and and he's using it so well uh, in, in this offense and Baker inside of the Shanahan scheme looks awesome because Baker has a legitimately strong arm he has a good ability to place the ball downfield and he has developed some bad tendencies as far as playing off of the first read but in this offense this is an offense designed to get guys like Cousins, Goff, Tannehill not to have to make tough decisions and make things easier on them and maximize their athletic traits to get on the move and utilize their arm talent to hit crossing routes and things like that and it's just a thing of beauty and that's not to discredit Baker Mayfield. You, you are obviously super excited if you're a Browns fan to see Baker get that mojo back. And for the most part, he is in that Tannehill, Goff, Cousins range of quarterbacks. 
where you feel pretty good about him. If you really had to lean on the guy to throw 40 times in a traditional sense, you'd be a little more worried. But I will say with Baker, he has a little bit more of that it factor. Like you have a little more confidence that on third and eight, he's not going to just take that check down and you're going to have to punt it on fourth and two, like you do with guys like Tannehill so much. Um, you know, he has a little more of that it factor and, and just kind of game feel to know, like, we need this first down, so I'm going to ball out here. I'm going to break a tackle. I'm going to run for this. I'm going to hang in the pocket and throw a tough contested ball over the middle that I probably shouldn't do. You'll get some more mistakes with that, so it's a give and take, but I'd rather have the, the guy that can do it, and if he fails, so be it. So I don't know if Baker's ever going to be an elite guy. He needs to develop a lot better tendencies and ability to read defenses and be a more consistent decision maker. But what you're seeing right now is a fringe top 12 quarterback right now, right in that Tannehill, Goff, Cousins grouping. And that is absolutely good enough to, dare I say, win a Super Bowl this year. I, I don't know. This was the first time we've really seen this passing game truly open up. They did it, I guess, against the Jags, which I talked about being a good sign for this Browns team. Um, I still have some hesitations on if they can match the Chiefs or match the Bills or the Packers or the Saints, who are legitimately great teams. I don't know if they can match that quite yet consistently in the playoffs to win a Super Bowl, but you're looking at a similar team to like Tennessee last year, for sure, where like they can play spoiler. They can have some really good games. And then defensively, they're they're getting there. Uh, Miles Garrett, when he's out there, is top three defensive player in the league. I mean, Donald's one, and then you're splitting hairs to me between T.J. Watt and Miles Garrett. They're very different players, but man, uh, he makes a huge impact. They're a little more thin at like linebacker and interior defensive line, but yeah, the Browns look good. They're they're a playoff team, and. For that to be the case is a huge step forward for the Browns, and they're a fun team to watch. Now, they're going to play the Ravens on Monday Night Football, and that is going to be a great Monday Night game. I'm excited for that one. All right, next up we have um, Indianapolis at Houston. It's important to emphasize how close Houston actually was to winning this game. They were down on the Colts' five-yard line or so. I think it was second and goal. And a snap comes in at Watson's knees. He wasn't ready for it, unable to fall on it, and a turnover with like 50 seconds left. They were down by six. So, like, they were right there about to beat the Colts. And all of a sudden, they'd be five and seven. And the Texans are a legitimate football team right now. And it is almost exclusively because of Deshaun Watson, who over the last month of the season is the third best quarterback in the NFL because of Russell Wilson's inconsistencies. And the thing with Watson has always been that we know he's capable of games like this, where he he truly put the team on his back. He made phenomenal plays. He was running for his life all day. And it's not like some of these other quarterbacks that sometimes I would say guys like even Russell sometimes, especially in this Giants game. uh, I think Lamar really struggles with this. And it's not always the end of the world, but sometimes these quarterbacks that know they can make these crazy plays with their feet will bail from clean pockets and do that too early. Well, Watson's been hanging in the pocket when he needs to, which is huge for him as a passer. That's a huge thing for becoming an elite passer is understanding when to hang in, when to bail. But in this game, he had to run on like every play. And it was always the case where like he had to, he was running for his life. We'll talk about the Colts pass rush uh, in just a second, but yeah, he was running for his life in this game. He was making phenomenal plays. He, he put the team on his back and did some crazy crazy stuff in this game. So Watson, I'd still rank him fourth, but he has outplayed Russell Wilson over the last month of the season. And we talked about how attractive this coaching stop is going to be for, you know, anyone to work with Sean Watson, really. Uh, and, and they've got some receivers, man. Like, yeah, they traded away to Sean Watson, uh, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, but you got Brandon Cooks, who's been fine. Brandon Cooks has been a solid number two deep threat for them. Will Fuller is awesome as a true deep threat. They got to find a way to bring him back, but I think they can figure that out. And then you even have Kiki Kuti, who we've all kind of liked. Like he's a really good athlete coming out of the Big 12, can make some plays, but he was making some tough catches in this game. He's got speed. Um, and then Chad Hansen comes up here. He was a fourth round pick for the Jets, I want to say, 
really good possession receiver. A lot of people compared him to Adam Thielen as that white dude, possession guy, tough guy, makes tough catches over the middle, all that stuff. He looked kind of Adam Thielen-esque in this game, making some tough catches. So they've got some receivers. You got Watson. You got the best left tackle in football, potentially with Laramie Tensel, if not the best top three, top five. Honestly, I would rather have Bakhtiari and Stanley, but, I mean, Tunsil's right there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they've, they've got some pieces. They'll be they'll be fine next year. Uh, they might be a team to bet on uh, as, like, the team to win the AFC South next year because uh, people are going to be sleeping on this, this Texans team, I think. Uh, we'll see who their head coach hires is, though. Uh, and then for the Colts, so this pass rush – they're clearly so much different when DeForest Buckner plays. And I was hesitant like a month ago to call DeForest Buckner an elite defensive tackle because at that point in time, he hadn't shown that week-to-week consistency. Even when he was on the Niners, like he was a really good pass rusher, but he was always kind of a tier below the week-to-week consistency of guys like Chris Jones, Kenny Clark, Prime Akeem Hicks, uh, Cam Hayward for the Steelers, guys that are consistently getting you you know, four or five pressures a week. You're looking at 60, 70 pressure seasons, often getting into double-digit sacks. That just hasn't been DeForest Buckner. It really wasn't DeForest Buckner um, in the first six, seven weeks of the season, but he's coming into his own in this defense, and he was going off in this game. Like, he looked like Chris Jones in this game. So DeForest Buckner elevating the ceiling of this defense with how he's playing right now I'm not going to admit I was wrong. Like, I'll stand by what I said. You need to establish a certain level of elite, consistent success before I call you an elite player. So I'm not going to apologize for saying that he wasn't an elite player, but he was starting to show those signs for sure. And I'll admit now that I've seen enough to say that he is, I'm not going to say he's better than Chris Jones, but I will put him right there with your Cam Hayward, with Stephon Tewitt, the way he's playing this year. Kenny Clark, Akeem Hicks is kind of on the downward trend here. But like he's in that grouping uh, as if you want to call that elite, that's up in the air, you know, Um, but he is he is phenomenal. He is tier one outside of Aaron Donald, who's just a freak. Um, But yeah, there's there's your uh, Colts Texans review. Uh, Colts are Colts are uh, making a push here. It's going to be a really interesting race between them and the Titans. Uh, The Colts are more of a steady week to week high floor lower ceiling team, whereas the Titans are more of this boom or bust high flux team. So it's going to be a coin toss between how that that wraps up. All right, Raiders at Jets. This was a fun game because the Jets almost won. It was the talk of the town. The Jags were going into overtime. It was like, oh my God, who's going to get the number one pick? What are the Jets doing? And then Greg Williams dials up a zero blitz. The game was over. All they got to do is play prevent defense was like nine seconds left and Greg Williams, like only Greg Williams can do, dials up a zero blitz with, not just that, he dials up a zero blitz with Lamar Jackson, the corner, who runs like a 4-6-40, like 4-5-8, like he is one of the slower starting corners in the league, legitimately. And he matches him up one-on-one with Henry Ruggs, who is probably the second fastest receiver in the league. And Ruggs just does a quick stutter, which Lamar Jackson, for some reason, bites on because he's not only slow, he's just young and inexperienced. So he bites on a double team. Like, obviously, Henry Ruggs is not going to run a hitch, Lamar Jackson, because there's nine seconds left and they're down by a touchdown. So a quick double move, and all of a sudden, Henry Ruggs is way past him. And Derek Carr, after missing a wide-open Nelson Aguilar up the middle because the safeties got lost... um, (laughs) <laughs> Derek Carr steps up in the pocket. That was nice to step up in the face of the blitz. But the throw was just like, all I got to do is not throw this out the back of the end zone. And he just got so much arc under it. And I mean, the throw is what it is. But my God, that was all about Henry Ruggs' speed, who Ruggs did not have a good day until that moment, against Greg Williams dialing up the blitz. And the initial reaction by myself and everyone else was like, how much are the Jets paying Greg Williams under the table to blow this thing? They fire him the next day. Now, I backed off of this because I saw a tweet from someone. I wish I had was able to credit it, but uh, someone went back and looked at Greg Williams in those situations in the past, and he historically dials up pressure like that. So I'm not going to say it was a tank call. I won't go that far, but 
if Greg Williams is all of a sudden retiring and posting pictures of some mansion in the Hamptons outside of the Jets stadium, like, he might have been getting some money under the table for that call right there. But uh, at the end of the day, the Jets are doing what any team in their position want to see. You want to see young guys stepping up, guys like Quinn and Williams, even Sam Darnold, for what it's worth, like was much better in this game. So you want to figure out what you have, but you also want to keep losing. You want to lose close games. So Jets are in a good place. I think this was their biggest scare. <laughs> I think they will finish on uh, just not undefeated without a win and get Trevor Lawrence. So for the Raiders, I'm not ready to overreact. You're obviously not stoked about how the offense looked against the Falcons last week. You're not happy uh, about some of the hiccups this week. And, you know, it, I'm not ready to overreact. It was just one of those days for the Raiders. Uh, Henry Ruggs coughed up the ball twice. He had a drop that got popped up in the air and intercepted. And then he fumbles a ball. Like, they were really in control for the majority of this game after a, a slow start because of that Henry Ruggs interception. Uh, and then they kind of let the Jets creep back in and it got out of control at the very end. We know the Raiders' defense is not good. Anyone that's been listening to me for a while knows that I don't, I don't think their defense is any good, and it's going to hold them back one way or another, even if you're playing the New York Jets. And the offense, honestly, was fine this week. I'm not really worried about the Raiders. Uh, they are who they are, and they're capable of a game like this where their defense plays poorly, they make a couple mistakes on offense, and all of a sudden, they're coming down to the wire against the New York Jets. So not much to really add on the Raiders. Uh, they do have a huge game against the Colts, though, this week. Uh, and that could ultimately decide their playoff fate. Uh, but it would be fun to see them get in because the Raiders are a fun team. All right, Bengals at Dolphins. So little to say about the Bengals. I mean, this offensive line is as bad as adver advertised. They were a little better in the first half with Jonah Williams in there. I think it's a testament to Jonah Williams who has to deal with probably the worst left guard in football next to him in Michael Jackson. Um, but Jonah Williams came out in the second half at some point, And after that, the, the Dolphins felt like they were sacking Brandon Allen every single play. It was absurd how much they struggled to move the ball in the second half. The Bengals are just so bad at football. And again, I just don't like the coach, Zach Taylor. Like, I don't think he's that good of a coach. He's maybe one of the 32 best coaches in the league, but I would want so much better for this team than Zach Taylor. Uh, Jesse Bates made another great play this week, continues to make a case for the top, if not that, top three safeties in the league. Uh, this time was punching the ball out late in this game. They had every reason to fold, um, but he was out on the perimeter of the defense. They bust a run up the middle, and he catches up to Miles Gaskin, who looks great, by the way, catches up, comes around the side and punches it out. So showing that he's not just a rangy center fielder, like he was playing down in the box a lot more and, uh, and, and they were asking him to, to deal with Mike Gesicki, who was going off in this game. And there was a couple good coverage reps against Gesicki manned up on him. Uh, so again, he's just he's not just a one-dimensional free safety. They use him in different ways. He is their best defensive player. And I think just continues to be an under-the-radar superstar in this league that people just don't know because they don't watch the Bengals. But Jesse Bates, their safety, is having a phenomenal season. Um, not like defensive player of the year or whatever, but... He should be first-team All-Pro safety, uh, at least. Okay, and then for the Dolphins, I was impressed by Tua for the most part. Um, there's some criticisms here. I'll get those out of the way and then finish with the good stuff. So he has had immense turnover luck. Uh, I'm sorry, Dolphins fans, it's true. He has put the, har the ball in harm's way much more than I expected for a guy that I thought would be kind of in that... Um, I don't want to say Alex Smith, but kind of in more of that game managing position. And he's kind of playing that role, but he's putting the ball in harm's way a lot. In the first half, I'll, I'll just say two. I think there might have been three. Um, but just throws where he is getting really dangerous over the middle of the field. Uh, Jesse Bates had another near interception, by the way, on, on a bad throw from two. I, I'm going to confidently say there was three plays now because I remember that Jesse Bates one. But there was a couple throws it, very similar to like year two Baker Mayfield where like he is almost predetermined like going to fire the ball into the second level whether it's an RPO or a dig route but like almost unconscious like 
unapologetically going to attack the second level of the defense. And he did that at Alabama. That's why I compared him to rookie year Baker Mayfield. I compared him to Jimmy Garoppolo, where those passers really go after that middle of the field. Now, those are decent quarterbacks. So you're not like all all pissed about it because Tua can do that. He can really efficiently use the middle of the field, but sometimes he won't see those linebackers underneath. And he will throw it right to the linebacker sometimes and he's done it a lot this year, and the balls just aren't la- ending up in the laps of the defenders, fortunately for Tua. Um, so some of that stuff, I, I want to see him get more careful with that stuff. Those are costly mistakes on routine plays uh, that you don't want to see from a potentially top 10 quarterback. If Tua wants to be a top 10 guy, he can't do that on a consistent basis. Now, he's still young. We've seen Baker weed some of that stuff out here in year three. Tua needs to do the same. So you're not going to you know, panic about that, but it's something he needs to work on. Now, a, a couple of really nice things about Tua. In the first half, he unleashed an absolute dime. He actually got pass protection, which is a rarity for him. Time, you know, three plus seconds in the pocket. And he let just a beautiful ball up the middle of the field. I think if you're going deep with Tua, he's much more comfortable over the middle of the field than he is outside the numbers. Um so he, he drops it right in the bucket for Jakeem Grant. And Grant is what he is. I don't think he's going to be consistently catching those types of throws. He's five foot seven, just for a variety of reasons. At that size, it's difficult to be a, an elite deep threat. But um, absolute dime from Tua. And I'm, I'm sitting there like, all right, that's, that's a little bit more of what I wanted to see from Tua. He, he did it sometimes at Alabama, but he's doing it in these crazy wide open windows. He doesn't have a, a rocket arm. He's got a solid arm. So I just want to see like, Everything else he does, he looks a lot like Russell Wilson. The way he moves, his release, his movement in the pocket, like he has a lot of Russell Wilson feel to him. But Russell Wilson is like this miraculous moonball thrower who's just dropping dimes down the field. That's missing with Tua in general. But you see that throw and you're like, all right, there is some upside there in the vertical passing game. It was one throw, but you love to see that from Tua. So you get that in there, just a note. Um, But the second half was really clean from Tua. Pretty much mistake-free football. uh, Really attacking the middle of the field well. Mike Gesicki was phenomenal in this game. He is exciting. He is just a fun player with a ton of upside. Uh, He's he's a tight end, right? Like, I remember checking this like five weeks ago. He's played like 85 plus percent of his snaps. It might have been 91 percent as a receiver. Like, yeah, he's a tight end. And I was watching some of his blocking reps when he was playing closer. And like, yeah, he just kind of runs up and like shoulders. Like he's not a tight end. He is by positional designation, but he's a he's a receiver. They'll flex. He plays more outside wide and certainly more in the slot than he does actually tight end. Um, but yeah, and anyway, two had a really good second half. At halftime, I was wondering, I hadn't seen the game, so I wasn't jumping to conclusions. I was like, are they going to bench him again? Because they've done that once already. Fitzpatrick has come in now and looked pretty good. And they needed to win this game against Cincinnati. They have a tough schedule coming up. And I was like, are they going to pull him again? And they didn't, to their credit. They stayed the course, and Tua responded very well. Credit to Tua, showing that mental toughness to be like, look, I've had a rough first half, but let's not make this a theme here. Let's learn from our mistakes. Let's be more careful over the middle of the field. Uh, And he did a great job in the second half. So great game for Tua in general. Bengals defense is what it is. uh, But ultimately, for a rookie quarterback to to have that kind of perseverance and and make some of those plays he made, you're you're mostly encouraged by Tua this week. Uh, So for the Dolphins defense, very little to truly take away here. Obviously an impressive performance, but the Bengals are just a train wreck. So... The front seven for Miami looked awesome in this game. I will say Xavier Howard is just a freaking ball hawk. I think, like, moving forward, I, I would still rather have Jalen Ramsey and uh, Jair Alexander. Uh, but Xavier Howard right there, his ability to play the ball is is maybe the best in the league right now. Like, he tracks the ball like a receiver. Um, So he, he's just been awesome for this defense. But, yeah, the front seven... These defensive ends, Shaq Thompson, uh, Shaq Lawson, Emmanuel Ogba, even Zach Sealer got in there. They were eating this offensive line all day. Uh, I noticed, uh, was it Raekwon Williams? The Yeah, I think Raekwon 
Raquan Davis out of Alabama, the third round pick who I like. They're actually using him at nose tackle. I was talking about him as more of a hybrid defensive end, but he's actually playing nose tackle for them and, and making a good impact there. So uh, they're a little bit undersized. Like Ogba and Lawson are not traditional 3-4 defensive ends, and Davis is big, but he doesn't really have the weight per height threshold to be a traditional nose tackle. Um, but they play so strong, and those guys are pound for pound really strong dudes. And when they're as quick as they are, it's a unique front that's really difficult to play against because those guys actually defend the run really well as an undersized group. And then if you try to go play action or you try to pass on that, um, when they show that base defense, they're going to be able to rush the passer too. So it's it's a very interesting front there in Miami. And that's not even mentioning... Christian Wilkins, who's showed some athleticism, he, he went up and dunked. Uh, I think they had a touchdown called back, but I think he picked up a scoop and score, and he shows off some athleticism. He actually dunks it, and he just got up. Uh, he's pretty quick. So uh, you really like what you have in that front four for Miami especially, and they're used in really nice ways. Uh, so then we got Detroit at Chicago. Not a ton to say here. Matthew Stafford was awesome in this game. If he plays even close to the way he played down the stretch here with Daryl Bevel at offensive coordinator, you're bringing Stafford back. You're not trading him. You might still draft a guy, but you're bringing Stafford back. Like that to me is very clear. I, I don't think you just move on from a quarterback like this uh, who's playing uh, this week at a super high level. We'll continue to evaluate him and, and measure that situation as we go, but that's really all you have to say about Detroit. Another kind of ding-dong, the witch is dead week for another team. I think teams are 3-0. and Atlanta, Detroit, and Houston are all undefeated the week they fired their head coach. And they were all upsets, I think. Uh, and then for the Bears, excuse me, uh, we kind of talked about Nagy. What do you do with him? Are you actually able to upgrade him? What do you perceive this as with the quarterback situation? Because... Trubisky and Foles are not good quarterbacks, and he's had to work with Trubisky his entire time here. Uh, if it wasn't Trubisky, it was Mike Glennon. So, like, the, the front office is not doing him any favors. There was a play. It's like they actually moved the ball pretty well, and Nagy actually kind of had a good game plan here. They were being really creative with Cordero Patterson. They were running the ball well with David Montgomery. Uh, they were really nice in the screen game. Like, he was doing everything he could to simplify things for Trubisky, they were even attacking the middle of the field well with Allen Robinson. This was their best offensive game of the season, by the way. But there was a play late in this game, two-minute warning. Uh, Chicago's up by two, maybe one. I think it's two. Uh, no, they're up three. They're up three with two minutes left, and they're backed up on like their own 10-yard line. And third and four, Detroit's expecting a run. And Nagy goes, spreads it out, and dials up a pretty simple levels concept. He's got all the receivers running about seven to eight yard hitches to kind of draw the uh, zone coverage back. And then he's got the first read, Darnell Mooney, running a drag underneath. And you know it's the first read because the ball is snapped and Mitch is looking right at the middle of the field. He's not looking outside. He's looking basically right at Darnell Mooney. And Mooney has good separation. He has the room to catch a drag and easily turn up field and get four yards. And for whatever reason, the ball just doesn't come out. And that to me is such so much the epitome of make it's so hard to and evaluate Matt Nagy um, because the quarterbacks just aren't doing what they're supposed to here. So I, I don't know what the right answer is here. I think you could do better than Matt Nagy, but I don't think he's necessarily like a terrible coach. I wouldn't say he's a great coach, but it's just very difficult to know, like, can you actually upgrade it? Are you making things worse if you fire him for someone that might not be better than him? It's just tough. It's just really tough. Uh, but one thing that's not tough is letting Trubisky go <laughs> and finally getting rid of him. New Orleans at Atlanta. New Orleans keeps winning. They're 3-0 with Taysom Hill. They were undefeated with Teddy Bridgewater last year. Sean Payton is just insane at manufacturing offense. Um, and in all of these games without Drew Brees, going back to last year, they've had to lean on that defense stepping up. And in almost all of those games, if not all of them, the Saints defense has done that and truly stepped up. 
right now the Saints defense is right there with the Pittsburgh Steelers, if not above the Pittsburgh Steelers. The pass rush has really come together since they got Marcus Davenport back. And the secondary is really coming together. So everything's really clicking for the New Orleans Saints on the defensive side of the ball. It's allowing them to win with this sort of ball control, conservative offense. Taysom Hill's doing a pretty good job taking care of the football. And Hill actually made some really nice throws on third downs in this game. A lot of great catches on those throws, but he put them in in a place where only his receiver could get it. And it was very frustrating for the Falcons. They couldn't get a stop on third down. And Taysom Hill was actually making those plays when they needed him. If he doesn't make a few throws here in this game, they probably do not win. So it's not all the defense. Taysom Hill looks like a quarterback you can win with. You're not going to have an explosive passing game with Taysom Hill. But if he can make some of those situational throws on third down, you, you run some conservative play calling as far as getting him involved as a runner, screens, get Alvin Kamara going, it can definitely keep them afloat. Now, I don't think they would win a Super Bowl with Taysom Hill. They need Drew Brees back if they really want to win a Super Bowl here. Uh, but, you know, they, they have a chance to hold on to that one seed with Taysom Hill playing like this. And that's a huge deal because only one team gets that first round by this year. Uh, and that's a huge deal for the Saints to get that, especially if it comes down to them needing that week to get Drew Brees healthy. So uh, interesting football going on for from New Orleans. But credit this defense that's been lights out. Uh, and then for Atlanta, it was a very frustrating game. The, the defense played overall okay, but they couldn't get off the field on third down. They gave up a ton of long throws from Taysom Hill, contested catches that they just weren't getting to work. Uh, and then you look at Matt Ryan. I mean, I know he's going against a good defense here, but ugh, he's just so frustrating to watch because you know this is a guy that people are going to say is a Hall of Fame quarterback. He's won an MVP. But my God, he's just pretty overrated. Like he is a very solid, above average quarterback. I don't I don't think of Matt Ryan as a Hall of Fame guy. Like he just, he's been around. He's put up a ton of numbers. A lot of it's garbage time. And I just, I don't know, man. He is so bad in the red zone. It's a combination of he's not mobile. Uh, like when you're in the red zone, you need to, you need some physical traits to elevate the fact that you're playing in such a tight area like you're not he's really good between the 20s when he's got these wide open fields and he's got Julio Jones getting wide open on crossing routes and Ridley burning dudes one-on-one but you don't get that in the red zone so you put him in these tight areas he's not scrambling to open up the passing game he's not throwing tight window throws like Justin Herbert and Matthew Stafford were this week like he can't do that he can't fit it into a tight window with the flip of a wrist in the red zone he can't do that And he's way too conservative. Like, he is such a terrible red zone quarterback. And I think that's been a massive shortcoming for the Falcons over the years. But, you know, they'll be fine. They'll bounce back one of these weeks. They'll put up a 30-burger. And the offense will light it up. And Julio Jones and Ridley will go off. Uh, But I just don't look at Matt Ryan as, like, if you want to talk about, A, the, the Hall of Fame conversation, B, the fact, how did he win an MVP when it was Kyle Shanahan, Julio Jones, um, I don't know about that one. And then also, like, if you're a head coach looking at the Atlanta Falcons, it, are you that excited to go work with Matt Ryan? That's why I, that's why I predicted um, a pretty uninspiring offensive coach there with getting uh, Mc, uh, McDaniels from the Patriots. So I don't know, man. Matt Ryan's just very deflating to watch on a week-to-week basis as someone that watches every game around the league. It's just kind of like bleh with Matt Ryan. He's fine. I'm not saying he's a bad quarterback by any stretch of the imagination. I think I would still probably rank him like 10th, but I just don't get excited about him. Uh, Okay, Rams at Cardinals here. So this was uh, a fun game. It was actually a lot closer than the final score indicated. This was neck and neck in the fourth quarter, and the Rams kind of pulled away. Um not much to really add on the Rams. They match up really well with teams like Arizona and Seattle because you're going to get that interior pressure from Aaron Donald and you have Jalen Ramsey to counter those teams' best weapons with DK Metcalf and DeAndre Hopkins. I mean, Jalen Ramsey, if you don't think he's the best corner in football right now with what he's doing to these top receivers, like, I don't know what to tell you. He is outstanding, especially against these bigger, more physical receivers. 
And he's following them around. You know, this isn't, I don't want to trash Richard Sherman because I think Sherman's a Hall of Famer and he's incredible, but Sherman has kind of been criticized for being a cover three corner that kind of stays on that side of the field. Whoever comes his way, he'll take out. But Jalen Ramsey will follow you around and take you out of the game. He's been incredible. Um, so yeah, the Rams kind of did their thing. They have not changed a thing on offense. Like they're going to run the ball a ton. They're going to mix in a ton of screens. Cooper Cup is super underrated. And they're pretty awesome. They might win the NFC West. This was a big, big week for them, but nothing really changed, on my opinion, on the Rams. Um, for Arizona, two, two pretty major problems right now. Number one is, and they're both, they're both, frankly, the the biggest problems I saw coming for Arizona. Number one was they're just squishy on both sides of the line. Their offensive line is not particularly good, and their defensive line is not particularly good. So you go against a team like the Rams or the Patriots a couple weeks ago. They're not going to back down. They're going to get some pretty nice production in the run game. And they're certainly going to be able to get four or five yards of carry, which is a problem. If they just run the ball all day and you can't stop it, that's a problem for any team. So Arizona's got to find a way to fix that. To me, it's much more about the discipline and the culture and the toughness of this defense than it is about the bodies. They could use some help from a roster point of view for sure. But they just have a lot of toughness to develop on the defensive side of the ball and the offensive line just it's been better especially in a pass protection standpoint but their run game is just not very reliable they don't have a physical element to this team on either side of the ball so when you go against the Patriots you go against the Rams that live off of toughness and discipline they're at a massive loss and then the other thing we predicted was just or at least saw coming was that that some of their shortcomings are going to come with the fact that this is a younger team they don't have some of those the the experience which is cliche but it's important like you need to have fallbacks uh, uh, as far as your schemes like you need to have play calls that you like to go to in certain situations that you remember from a big game a year ago or two years ago you need to have that chemistry between uh, not so much um hopkins and kyler but guys like andy isabella and, and christian kirk like they don't really know what they're doing on third and six. Like they're not on the same page on that, that side of it. And then defensively, they're kind of all over the place. So it's just a young team. Cliff Kingsbury has not been particularly impressive. I think he's been fine, but similar to what we said about the Bengals, like you want upside. If Kyler Murray is your quarterback, you want a really nice coach to pair with him. And I I don't know if you have that in Cliff Kingsbury. I think we give them one more year next year, but they gotta they gotta start to establish some more physicality as a team. And you know, Cliff Kingsbury's never won, and he played in the Big Twelve. That's always gonna get criticized for a lack of toughness, and they're kind of a Big Twelve team right now in Arizona. Uh, so that that is that game. Then we got the Eagles at Green Bay. We've beaten the fire Doug Peterson thing into the dirt. Uh, it started last year. I was not impressed. I was really early to this one with Doug Peterson. I'll take a victory lap on that one. I mean, it's just not. It's just not a good coached, a well coached team. I think they're the the worst coached team in the league. I mean, you can make cases for the Jets. You can make cases for the Chargers, but on a consistent play to play basis, no team is as lost and has no scheme identity on offense and has a high enough amount of plays where the guys, the ball gets snapped and the players literally don't know what they're supposed to do. That happens way too often in Philadelphia. And that is at the core, the worst thing you could do as a head coach is just not be prepared to snap the ball and execute a play call. So it's ugly here with Doug Peterson. Wentz gets benched here. And you would think I would really dive into this, but I talked about this last week. I talked about this being what they need to do. Wentz clearly is not it this year. He has had a tragic falling from grace. And if you want to hear more about this, go back to last week because that hasn't changed. He played like crap again this week, and eventually they did make the decision to bench him. Like I said last week, they should do. The next stage here is to fire Doug Peterson. I don't know if they're going to do that. We talked about that earlier. Uh, And then you're just going to kind of see what you have in Hurts. Again, like I talked about last week, if he plays great, awesome. You're excited about that. You found a quarterback in Jalen Hurts who can transcend all this garbage. I don't see that happening. They play the Saints this week. Yeah, Hurts came in, was a spark plug. We've seen other quarterbacks do that. We've seen Ryan Fitzpatrick do that. So I don't know. Hurts is not a refined passer. He's done some nice things to grow as a passer over the years, and and I'll give him a chance. I was not particularly high on him coming out, but uh, 
we'll, we'll see what they have in Hurts, and they're going to have some decisions to make moving forward. Not much to really add on the Eagles, though. They're garbage. And then for Green Bay, um, I want to talk about Aaron Rodgers and the MVP because there's this sort of aura that Patrick Mahomes has just already won the MVP. And I, I'm sorry, but like Rodgers has traditionally just not gotten the credit he deserves when he does really well. Uh, I We talked about Matt Ryan winning the MVP in 2020. 15 or whatever the fact that Rodgers didn't win the MVP playing with that team coached by Mike McCarthy going on one of the all-time great stretches of about 10 games just the run the table narrative like I honestly looking back on it cannot believe based on what the award should mean as most valuable player that Aaron Rodgers did not win it that year and it, it kind of applies here to Green Bay compared to Patrick Mahomes and it's only because Rodgers is actually having as good of a statistical season as Patrick Mahomes, if not actually better. Um, Mahomes has more passing yards, absolutely. Uh, I'm not going to say Rodgers has had yards left on the table for drops because Mahomes has also had some pretty bad drop luck, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a push. But um, Rodgers could realistically, based on the narrative right now, he could realistically throw... 48 touchdowns to six, inter- six interceptions. That is the pace he's on pace for. Uh, he's thrown three touchdowns every week. So if he continues that pace against the Lions and they play, I know they play the Lions. They play the Panthers, who are not a good defense. They play the Titans, who they're, he's going to have to put up some points there. And then they play the Bears again. So if he throws another um, 12 touchdowns, which I think is selling it short, I think he could throw 14 15 touchdowns and get up to 15 touch uh, 50 touchdowns to six interceptions over 4,500 yards and potentially break his own single season quarterback record for the best quarterback rating in NFL history. He could do all those things and they would still give it to Patrick Mahomes because he's still kind of the hot new thing and everyone loves what he's doing. And I think Rodgers is just really quietly frankly, been the best quarterback on a week-to-week basis this season. He had the one bad game against the Bucs that people love to point out. Uh, game got out of control. It is what it is. But, you know, Rodgers, I don't think he's getting quite enough respect in the MVP debate when you really stack up the numbers. And then that's not even getting into the fact that Rodgers literally just has Devontae Adams. Like, he's throwing to Alan Lazard. He's trying to throw the ball to Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who... Whether he's wide open or contested, it's a 50-50 ball. He's hot garbage. They don't have a tight end. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll give uh, LaFleur some credit. He's been a really good play caller. I think he's been up there right behind Andy Reid. But just from the players that he has to work with, I mean, Mahomes has the biggest mismatch problem. Quite frankly, Mahomes might have the two biggest mismatch problems in the entire league with Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey paired with really creative play calling. So for this idea that Mahomes has already won the MVP, when Rodgers is week by week actually putting up better numbers, is the number one rated quarterback on pro football focus. He's on pace to shatter the all-time PFF grade for a quarterback. He's potentially, if he, so he's at 118 for his quarterback rating right now. That'd be fourth all-time behind Peyton Manning and then that weird Nick Foles season where he didn't even play all 16 games. Um, but Rodgers has the, already has the number one quarterback rating year when he won MVP in 2011 at 122. With the defenses he's set to play, I think he could break that. So he could break that, break the PFF record, throw 48 touchdowns to six interceptions, and they would still give it to Patrick Mahomes because that's been the narrative all year. Um, so I just want to give Rodgers some love. I don't know if he'll win the MVP or not, uh, but... It's getting down to the home stretch here, and and for people to say that it's definitely Mahomes, I think that's just really insulting to Rodgers because he's doing a great job with way less than Mahomes has. So just just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, And then another big thing for Green Bay here, other than the fact that this offense is really electric, like they are really hard to stop. They're a little matchup dependent because they lean so much on that Rodgers to Devontae Adams connection. And if you can take that away, they just don't really have other top-end players to beat you with. So a little matchup dependent there, but they are the number one scoring offense in the league. 
Um, but another thing that they really have going for them is their defense has definitely had their ups and downs this year, but they're getting really nice contributions right now from their two first round picks last year that have really been quiet to this point. Darnell Savage and Rashawn Gary, who are what you call spark freaks, the spark athletic testing. Green Bay likes to take these guys. They don't always work out. But both Gary, who's had to reshape his body to be more of an outside linebacker pass rusher, as opposed to the 280 defensive end, 280 pound defensive end he was at Michigan, he's had to totally reshape his body. He has totally come on for Green Bay in the last month. He's been one of their best defensive players. And Darnell Savage has been a ball hawking free safety for them. He has shown some amazing athletic burst. His first three, four steps are unlike most players in the league. It's very Eddie Jackson-esque, the way he can kind of recognize a ball and just go. So he's got he's got three pretty good picks over the last three weeks. He had the one against Hertz that was a def- it was a batted ball. It was definitely a lucky interception, but it's not like it landed right in his lap. Like he had to really get there. And you look at all 22 on that film, like I don't think most safeties are going to intercept that ball because the the speed he shows to track a ball that's quickly approaching the dirt you know there's definitely other safeties that would have made that play just as easily but that list is pretty short of guys with that athletic traits um so they're getting key contributions uh from both these guys and it's it's boosting the ceiling of this defense because they've had some holes there but you get gary as a good pass rusher you get a more reliable free safety in darnell savage all of a sudden that secondary is coming together that pass rush is coming together The linebackers are getting healthy there with Kirksey and the the young Kamal Martin, who's playing great. So if this defense can just be a solid defense that doesn't give up too many big plays and uh, can create some turnovers with uh, some high upside players, and you have a corner in Jair Alexander who can take away a number one receiver who, depending on the matchup, is going to be a really valuable asset for them, Green Bay is just kind of really nicely coming together here uh, on all phases of the game. And they're not playing the best teams right now, but you're seeing some of the things that will translate to success in the playoffs, namely having Aaron Rodgers playing the way he's playing right now. All right, we got three, four, five, six games left, but very little to add on these games. Uh, So let's get through the rest of these here. New England at the LA Chargers. (laughs) Not a whole lot to say here. It was a historic game. I really don't know if any of us will go the rest of our lives until we see a football team rapid fire semi-automatic shots of whatever type of gun you want to choose into their legs all game like shooting themselves in the foot play after play after play I tweeted about it I'll try to link that if you're watching this on YouTube if you didn't see this game the cut up I made like you can just look at that and say okay yeah you can kind of throw that game away it was just ridiculous the amount of mistakes they made now that is the chargers they tend to do that and you hold that against them but to project them to do that on the level that they did in this game they had they had a missed field goal they had a a field goal blocked for a touchdown they gave up a punt return touchdown they gave up another punt that went about 50 yards all the way back to their 10 yard line they got a stop on third and 19 and a roughing the passer call this is when the game was still close a roughing the passer call kept the, the drive alive. That allowed New England to go up 21-0. Uh, they had a another stop late in the game, but on fourth and five, they had a 12 men on the field penalty on a punt return that allowed the Patriots to extend their drive. I think they turned that into a field goal. Uh, they had another rough in the passer call late in the game. And yeah, I mean, that's your list. It's, it's ridiculous. And that's not even mentioning the amount of drops they had on offense. So just they didn't, they, it was just not even competitive. Ridiculous outing for the Chargers. Not sustainable if you want to project it moving forward. The other thing is Justin Herbert was not good in this game. We've cut other rookie quarterbacks slack going against Bill Belichick, which is becoming one of the most consistent truths in football is that Bill Belichick is going to take a dunk, uh, take a dump on your rookie quarterback. For whatever reason, he knows how to confuse rookies, get them to see ghosts <laughs> like Sam Darnold. Um, and that happened for Herbert. He was just simply put, not good in this game. He has now had two absolute stinkers this year, was terrible in the Miami game. He's had three other games where he's had played pretty well, but then had absurd, costly mistakes that lost them the game, or at least put them in a really bad position to lose the game. And then in the other six games, he's been really solid. So I look at, at Herbert as like a young Matthew Stafford who had a lot of these same problems. 
And I think that's just I, I see so much Matthew Stafford when I watch Justin Herbert. And that's a that's a win for the Chargers. If you took Matthew Stafford sixth overall, you're happy about it. But he's a quarterback that you do need to surround with help. Um, so I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Like I'm not gonna bash Herbert here. He was bad. He played Belichick. His team didn't show up. So it is what it is. Um, and then did I have anything else? I, I didn't really have anything else to say about New England. I mean, they ran the ball well. Cam Newton had 70 passing yards in this game. The defense continues to play great. This was a dream for Belichick to have special teams play like this, to go against a soft team like the Chargers where he can just run the ball a bunch. Um, Great matchup for New England. I picked them to win for this reason. It all kind of played out. Um, Let's move on to the Jags-Vikings game. Uh, The Jags were much more out of this game than the final score would indicate. This game actually went to overtime, but on their first drive, Mike Glennon threw a pick for all intents and purposes, but it gets deflected and lands in the lap of uh, of uh, LaVisca Chenault's hands in the end zone. So they get what should have been a turnover, turns into seven points. And then right before half, as Minnesota was kind of regaining momentum, they ran a screenplay. Dalvin Cook, for whatever reason, didn't look back for the football. And Kirk throws it, anticipating Cook to look back. He never does. And Joe Schobert comes in and pick sixes it. So two kind of fluky plays. That's back-to-back weeks, some fluky plays, uh, making the game look closer than it did. Vikings offense is really good. Their defense is fine. Zimmer continues to scheme up a pretty good defense here, getting some of these young guys to step up. Uh, But, yeah, Minnesota is a scary team for this playoff push. Very little has changed for Jacksonville. But, yeah, for Minnesota – you're looking at this team. If they can get to 10 wins, they need to win out. It's not going to be easy. They have to beat the Saints. They have to play the Titans this week, I think it is. That's not going to be easy. But I'm not going to count them out, especially if they get Taysom Hill's Saints. It it could be done. And I don't think anybody wants to play this Vikings team. They can move the ball really well. Gary Kubiak is doing a phenomenal job with this offense. I think... I know he's older, but he's just another Minnesota offensive coordinator that has established himself as a head coaching candidate. And Mike Zimmer is doing a great job coaching this team up. They've shown some perseverance in recent weeks. Just all in all, impressive back end of the season for the Minnesota Vikings. Kind of regressing to the mean, right? They had some really tough losses early on, close losses, lots of injuries, young team but we knew this was a talented team. Maybe not a true Super Bowl team, but they're they're regressing back to that 9-10 win mark where I had them to start the year. Denver at Kansas City. Um, just reviewing my notes here. Getting a little long here. But I, I didn't really expect a blowout in this game. Denver's been kind of scrappy. They've been tough. Vic Fangio is not going to give up a lot of blowouts. Like His defense is going to come to play, especially for a primetime game, interdivision. Uh, but Patrick Mahomes did his thing. Drew Locke remains not good. Just kind of a what we thought type of performance here. I, I want to give Vic Fangio a lot of credit for the front seven here. Uh, Malik Reed stepping up. Draymond Jones, these linebackers. Everyone playing their best version of themselves. Vic Fangio. There was some stupid report that the Broncos might fire him. That's ridiculous. Drew Locke is a terrible quarterback, and this team has been ripped to shreds. They should be way worse than they are. I think Vic Fangio is just a really good coach, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And then for Kansas City, not much to really add. They had two plays, very easily could have gone the other way, and all of a sudden they cover that 14-point spread. So you have the kind of crazy Tyreek Hill play. It, it kind of is what it is. Like it bounced around, landed in his lap. You could call it lucky that it landed in his lap to begin with. And then you could say it was unlucky that the refs didn't see that the ball never hit the ground and it actually was a touchdown. But that resulted in a punt. And then they have another play that beautiful Patrick Mahomes throw. They end up calling holding on it. Uh, that one gets called back. Uh, so they had two huge touchdowns to Tyreek Hill that did not end up counting here. Uh, so the score ended up being a little lower and it just kind of is what it is Kansas City was the better team they ultimately won out in the fourth quarter it's just kind of what the Chiefs do even if they don't click all the way through they're still going to probably outmatch you in the fourth quarter and that's basically what happened here 
Washington at Pittsburgh. I've talked about Washington a lot at this point. Like the narrative remains the same. They're not a talented football team. Nobody's really going to argue that. But the W in the their their logo is a big W for Washington football team. To me, it stands for why not us? Because that is the mentality of this team. The head coach, Ron Rivera, had cancer and has, for all we know, overcome it. Alex Smith was was never supposed to play football again, and he's playing as a starting caliber quarterback. He's not an explosive quarterback at all. He's not a very good quarterback at all. But he's a game manager. He's going to take care of the football and let this team win games 20-17 to 17 if they can. If the defense plays well, which it's very capable of, if they have talent, it's on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, but yeah, they're they're doing what they can to take advantage of a very fortunate situation that they could potentially win the division at six wins. Love the coaching, love the culture. It's helping elevate other guys. You're seeing guys like Logan Thomas, Cam Sims play really good football. The offensive line's coming together. The defense is forming out. So like it's helping establish some more hype heading into next year. But they're just kind of this underdog, Cinderella, why not us story. I think even if you're a Cowboys fan or an Eagles fan, how could you not root for these guys? Like, it is just such a good, feel-good story. But are they a Super Bowl contender? Hell no. Like, they just don't have the talent to consistently win games like this. They can do it maybe two out of ten times against a team like Pittsburgh. And this was two of those ten times where they kept the score down. Um, and just weren't the team that made the mistakes, but, uh, yeah, there's your Washington Pittsburgh breakdown. Not gonna, not gonna really overreact to Pittsburgh. I've been talking about how they're not the, this elite undefeated juggernaut. Like they're an average offense. Big Ben is not an explosive passer. Steelers fans disagreed with that early on. It's very clear that they want to run slants. They want to run screens, they want to run the ball, period. They want to have a conservative offense. If these receivers can generate big plays because they're phenomenal athletes, that's great. And they'll take some deep shots, but they're just not always pretty. And then they want to play great defense. They're just a better version of the Washington football team, honestly. So not going to overreact to the Steelers. I I think this kind of put them back in that top six team. They're Right in that cluster with the Saints, the Packers, the Steelers. They're going to play the Bills this week. I think they probably lose. They're currently underdogs against the Bills. I think that's correct. Um, but yeah, like they they could technically beat the Chiefs if they came out and played really well. And then if you knock the Chiefs out, this whole thing opens up. But it's just a matter of can anyone do that? I think the Steelers are one of the teams that could do it. It's just not likely. All right, Buffalo at San Francisco. For the Niners... The defense really struggled this week, lost a little luster for this team. It really felt like they were coming together on defense and Robert Saylor was putting together this kind of head coaching candidate push as a really well-coached defense, but they just kind of lack the talent, uh, mainly up front, and it, it's just not a defense that I think is going to consistently play well, especially without, with Bosa up there. They just don't have the pass rush. Josh Allen did whatever he wanted to the Niners' defense. It didn't matter what Sayla called. They just didn't have the talent to match up. And the offense with Nick Mullins isn't going to be able to keep pace. Like, they tried. They played really well in offense. They played probably better than I expected they would. And that's a credit to Shanahan. Mullins was fine. But, yeah, they just, they're kind of out of it at this point. I don't see them sneaking in at 9-7 and seven or anything like that. Uh, they're going to have to reset, figure out, if they're going with Jimmy next year and come back next year healthy, uh, and they'll be right in the mix next year with Shanahan and these superstars back. Not too worried about them, but kind of a lost year with all these injuries. For the Bills, Josh Allen was amazing. Virtually mistake-free football. The athletic traits just shine through. Uh, and then paired with Brian Dable, who's just scheming up a great offense, the Bills are quite possibly the second best team in the AFC because they are consistent. They keep coming on a week-to-week basis because they are so deep at every position group. They're well-coached. They have a a really nice explosive quarterback who's playing awesome football right now, Uh, but they have the upside as well. Like if, if they got into a shootout with the Chiefs, 
there's a chance they could keep pace. It's not likely. At some point, you would probably think Josh Allen, you're asking too much of him, and eventually he makes a critical mistake. But at the same time, Mahomes can do that too. So it's really a a matter of luck and circumstance. But like, I think the Bills could get into a shootout with the Chiefs and win a game 38 to 35 if they had to. Again, not likely, but I think they have a better chance of doing that than the Steelers. Um, that's really I have to all I have to say about the Bills. They're they're awesome. We talked a lot about Brian Dable and and how great of a job he's doing with that offense. Uh, so let's get to the last game here: Dallas at Baltimore. For Dallas, I've said some nice things about Jerry Jones over the years, but if they don't fire Mike McCarthy, I'm gonna lose pretty much all respect and every nice thing I've said about Jerry Jones because it's becoming a theme and a trend of him being too loyal to mediocrity. It started with Zeke. The fact that they extended him as early as they did, Zeke was a good running back. Absolutely not worth 15 plus million dollars. And he had two years left on his contract and he held out, was being a little crybaby out in the Bahamas and was like, I'm not playing until you pay me. And Jerry Jones was like, oh no, Zeke, like I have to make you happy. And he paid him. And if he does the same thing with Mike McCarthy, who is not a good coach, but he stays loyal to him because he likes McCarthy and he, he's the right face for his franchise and he lies to himself about like, oh, it, it was just because Dak was hurt. Like that's the wrong answer, Jerry Jones. And if you can't, if you can't acknowledge that, then I'm, I don't feel bad for you. That's a mistake. Mike McCarthy has got to go. You have to do better than this. It's, it's that simple. Um, wherever he goes, the defense gets worse. He's an offensive mind, but he needs to oversee the defensive side of the ball. He needs to make sure the defensive guys are doing the right things. And he lazily hired uh, Ken Norton. Is that, is that the defensive coordinator? I, I'm sorry. It might be something else. But he lazily hired a guy he worked with like 15 years ago for basically no good reason. And he's just letting him do whatever he wants, and it's not working. Like at some point, you gotta have the right guys working on the defense if you're an offensive mind. And McCarthy does not have that ever. Um, for the Ravens, great win. They come off of one day of practice with Lamar Jackson, and they beat down a Cowboys team that they match up really well because they have the secondary to match up with Dallas's receivers. They have the front seven to eat Dallas's offensive line. And honestly, you can run on the Cowboys pretty easily. They're pretty squishy up front. They have no gap discipline. They don't play physical. So that was a pretty no-brainer win for the Ravens. Uh, I ended up picking them on the spread, and they covered. And that made a lot of sense. Now, they got to play the Browns this week. The rest of their schedule is pretty easy. They got to play the Jags, the Giants, and the Bengals. So if they beat the Browns, they're going to finish 11-5, which... Toot toot, that is where I had them. Coming into the year, I I projected some regression for the Ravens. It's almost been identical to what I expected, where the offense was not going to look like it did last year. Defenses figure out the read option thing. They don't have the same health. Lamar has to do a little more as a passer. It doesn't necessarily look pretty, but Lamar can still make some plays. The defense is great. An 11-win team. And I want to say I actually picked the Steelers to win the division, but I know I had them both at 11-5. But anyway... They can finish 11 and 5. They can get into the playoffs. And they have upside for sure, but they have a lot of injuries. Like without Ronnie Stanley out there, with the offensive line in the state that they're in, and the receivers, like Marquise Brown made a nice catch in this game, but he has not been good over the course of the season. They do get Mark Andrews back. He is the integral focal point of that offense. That'll be big. Uh, so, you know, no one's going to look forward to playing the Ravens as a wild card. That's for damn sure. I don't know if they have the passing upside to to win a Super Bowl, but it, it would be good to at least get 80% of the Ravens into the playoffs. Cause I mean they could absolutely be that that team. If you want to if you want the most interesting, and, and I picked the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, so I'm not necessarily saying I want this to happen, but if you want things to get interesting and you want someone to upset the Chiefs, and then all of a sudden the AFC is wide open. I think the Ravens could do it. I think the, and, and you know, this is an upset. I'm not saying I would be picking them to do it. I'm just saying it's 
in the realm of possibilities because they have the upside to do it. I think the Ravens could do it. I think the Bills have the best chance of doing it. And I think the Steelers could do it if they could have a really nice game of defense and force it out of Mahomes. The rest of the AFC, I don't know if the Browns could do it. I don't think the Raiders, Dolphins have that upside. Titans, if they got a really good game, if they had some really big plays, could do it. The Colts, I just don't know if they have the upside on offense to do it. So maybe the Titans are the other team. But uh, yeah, I think if you if you want the, the AFC to get interesting and you need someone to beat the Chiefs, I think the Ravens are probably one of three teams to do it. So they're gonna they're gonna probably finish strong. They're definitely gonna finish ten and six. I don't know if they'll beat Cleveland because they gotta play Jacksonville, the Giants, and the Bengals. They should win all three of those games. Um, but yeah, I don't know if they'll beat Cleveland or not. That that's gonna be a tough game for them. All right, I'm gonna take a real quick break. We'll wrap up with the mailbag and then we'll get out of here. All right, time to wrap up with the Patreon mailbag. So again, guys, patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Just $1 a month gets you access to the mailbag where you can submit your questions for the show. So we're going to start with a question from Nick Dykema, Dykema, D-Y-K-E-M-A. Not quite sure how you say that, but what do you think causes players like Justin Herbert to play bad in college, then come into the NFL and just completely flip the script and play so great? Very simple, uh, easy answer would be scheme fit. Scheme fit is not everything in the NFL, but it's incredibly important. And, you know, it's not that Herbert was like terrible in college. And I I would say that some of those flaws he had at Oregon, as far as trying to do too much, making sporadic bad decisions out of, out of structure, that's still been there. I don't think the jury's out on Justin Herbert, like being this great top 10 quarterback. I don't think that that's a, a lock by any stretch of the imagination, but Clearly, Oregon had no idea how to harness Herbert's talent. And as bad as the Chargers are, they at least let him rip it, right? They scheme up some great downfield looks, utilize that arm talent. Oregon was just constantly throwing screens and making him throw on his first read. And I think it it, it made Herbert uncomfortable, like, in college when he did have to go off of rhythm because he just barely ever had to do it so when they finally covered up that slant on third and four or they didn't call a bubble screen like he just wasn't used to having to play under pressure and go to his next read and then there was the also the other part of this is coaching I've talked about this with Herbert it was something that very small thing on hard hard knocks that caught my attention where the Chargers were on hard knocks by the way one of the very first episodes, one of the very first practices of Herbert's career because there was no OTAs, like training camp was it. And they're doing walkthroughs and uh, Pep Hamilton, the quarterback's coach for the Chargers, had to be like, Justin, go through your reads, go through your progressions when we're doing walkthroughs. That tells me that at Oregon, they didn't even have him going through his progressions. They were so first read dependent there that when they're doing walkthroughs, one of the most integral parts of practice, they didn't even worry about telling him. In the four years that he was there, they didn't even worry about saying, okay, yeah, that's that's your first read, but picture it in your mind. Picture if that linebacker jumps that, what's the next read? Go through your progressions. Something as simple as that was not there at Oregon, and that's an impossible thing to predict, that he was actually that poorly coached at Oregon. Nobody said that in the pre-draft process. No one questioned it. Now, coming out of Oregon, we might have some second thoughts about guys. Like, okay, there might be some things we can coach up. So, you know, there's NFL draft, especially with quarterback, it's so, so dynamic. It's why it's so fun. Uh, It's so hard to analyze and be right all the time. But I think those are two, in Justin Herbert's situation, two very glaring things that are different and why he's been a much better quarterback in the NFL than his draft uh, resume would have would have projected. Um, from Vic, have you read the Stephen Ruiz Wentz article? Uh, sorry, forgive me as I work through this. You talk about play-to-play consistency, and the article took a look back at Wentz's 2017 season and pointed out his first and second down play was average and 
on level with the rest of his career, while third down was at an unsustainable level of greatness. So basically you're saying, like pointing out that in his 2017 season, Wentz actually wasn't very good in rhythm, but he did so much crazy shit out of structure that he graded out well and looked like an MVP. So this starts to point the question of why did Wentz regress so hard? Was Wentz even good to begin with? Trying to find the question here, Vic. I'm reading these live. Keep that in mind, my my man. (laughs) I got to find the question in all this. Here we go. What made Wentz stand out compared to Herbert and Stafford? Um, it, I mean, just the the plays he made in what I, I thought was an MVP year, they truly were spectacular. I mean, truly, like, about to get sacked, getting out of it miraculously, and then hitting a 40-yard play that turns into a touchdown. Constantly making plays on third down to move the chains, game-winning plays, like the consistency at which his di- he did it. That I get what you're saying. Like, yeah, Wentz has never been a great rhythm player. First and second downs have always been an issue for him. But the the where it's changed is like 2017 Wentz. Talk about what Russell Wilson does so well, what Deshaun Watson does so well. It's consistently making those wow plays when things aren't there for you. And yeah, I agree. Wentz has never been an elite rhythm player. It's it's the biggest thing that's held him back over his career. But what isn't there in Philadelphia now is those wow plays. And to tell you why those wow plays aren't there so consistently, you see the flashes, but why his pocket presence is so bad and why he's so inaccurate and why he's making much worse decisions on those wow plays, you could say it was never sustainable, but Watson and Wilson, they do it sustainably. Yeah, they'll have some hiccup games here or there, but it's not bad all year. And that's what's so intriguing with Wentz is, is that something you could bring back in? Is there an offensive scheme that could make him a little more comfortable on first and second down? The talent is there. The talent is absolutely there. But yeah, why is everything going wrong here? I don't know. Maybe it's a confidence thing. Maybe the injuries have stacked up. Maybe his mechanics are broken. It's probably all of those things. But he is an absolutely fascinating case study. And I'm not ready to give up on Wentz, but you obviously acknowledge that he has been a miserable player this year for lots of different reasons. If you're the Chiefs, do you try to bring back Ward or Breland after the season? Also, do you think DeAndre Baker could get any reps this year? If so, what's his upside? Also, the quality and and quantity of content you've been putting out has been amazing. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate it. So, yeah, the Chiefs obviously have some cap issues, thin secondary. They're going to have to make some tough decisions. Um, I, I don't know if it makes a huge difference. Ward and Breland are very similar players. I will say that Breland, maybe a little of a quicker guy. If you want to play the matchups, I like what you have in Legereus Sneed to potentially replace Ward. So maybe you go Breland, who might be a little cheaper. I think they're probably about the same if you have to choose. I would say yes, you try to get one back. If you can't afford it, it is what it is. They found Breland cheap. They found Legereus Sneed cheap. I think they could find it somewhere else. And maybe that is DeAndre Baker because Baker still has not been picked up, right? Um, but yeah, as far as DeAndre Baker, I didn't love the pick when the Giants made it. I thought he was a late first, early second rounder. My comp for him was Marcus Peters. So that sounds great, but he's not a phenomenal athlete. If he runs a ton of man coverage, you don't feel great about it. He's a good tackler. He's a physical guy. I don't mind him as a slot corner somewhere. I think his upside, if that's the question, would be a Marcus Peters where he finds a really comfortable home and he becomes a good risk taker and can be a good playmaker. But I don't think he'll ever be an elite corner. I don't know if he ever was going to be, especially with a guy that clearly has some kind of off-the-field questions there with DeAndre Baker, even though he was found innocent. You don't get into a situation like that without something going on. Uh from Spencer, ignoring the Dave Gettleman defensive tackle of the week, how has 
my opinion changed on Dave Gettleman. He, I, I gave him credit for the 2020 draft. I mean, anybody has the right to change my mind. Dave Gettleman before 2020 was freaking awful, dude. Like, worst GM in the league, awful decisions, constantly taking players without positional value. But he said, heading into this offseason, he was like poking fun at the computer geeks, but like he really was saying, like, I want to be more modern. Like, I hear my criticisms. I think they're real. I want to be a better GM. Like, you got to give the man credit. And he drafted two offensive tackles that I really like. Andrew Thomas looks like he's going to work out. He's playing much better football. And I said, coming into the draft, like, Andrew Thomas was my offensive tackle number one. But I also acknowledged that his technique in traditional pass sets needed more work out of any of those top four guys and he's worked at it gotten good coaching and he's he's rounding out the back end of his career um he's he's valuing receivers he has not traded evan ingram away he re-signed Shepard. he's kept tate around he's understood that offensive line receivers that's how daniel jones is going to succeed now he took daniel jones we'll see how that all plays out he's been better than expected but he hasn't been great um the the signings he made has been great Blake Blake Martinez I did not understand the signing at all time will tell if that proves to be worth the money but to Dave Gettleman's credit he saw something in Blake Martinez working with Joe Judge to be like yeah he could be a critical leader for this defense and he was right I mean he's been a very nice player for them you still see some of the lack of movement skills when he gets in space but he's in a scheme now that does a much better job of not exposing those things whereas green bay they were just having him come out and try to play coverage in the middle of the field that's not is not what you want him doing they can put jabril peppers in those situations instead of blake martinez and then bradbury's been one of the best free agent signings period so like yeah gettleman has impressed me i'm kind of done bashing him like he's at least a solid general manager at this point and the thing has always been with gettleman i've never backed off at this point He can scout. He's a really good scout. Like Saquon, phenomenal prospect. Dexter Lawrence, phenomenal prospect. But it was the positional value and team construction aspects that was a question mark for me. So he's pairing them together and people keep saying they should fire him. I I don't think think that's the case. If if you were going to fire him, you should have done it before he showed these improvements. Um, From Nicholas Craig... What made you become a Packers fan? Were you a fan of any other team before them? So that's all my dad. My dad um, grew up on the East Coast. He grew up a Baltimore Colts fan, was Philadelphia Eagles for a little bit. Uh, his family moved to Minnesota. He cheered for the Vikings for a bit. He went to school in Wisconsin and I think grew a love for the Packers. Uh, so when I was born, my dad was a Packers fan, and then we definitely grew together as Packers fans. Um, so that's, that's where my core Packers fandom comes from. But as you guys know, I feel like I'm less and less of a Packers fan these days. I'm more critic, I'm more of a critic of the Packers for a lot of their shortcomings. Uh, they they become harder and harder to cheer for every year with how questionable their organization is at at times as far as decision-making, but um yeah that's where my football roots are at least uh from logan good nature what would the vikings need to add this offseason in order to become legitimate title contenders oh boy viking i mean anytime kirk cousins is your quarterback it's very difficult to say legitimate title contenders especially when he's got that massive contract they don't have a ton of cap flexibility I mean, in order for me to take them seriously as a championship team, you're talking about realistically signing a guard or drafting a guard, if not two guards, Ezra Cleveland working out at left tackle to the point where you have a reliable, steady offensive line. And then you're talking about defensively, you get Hunter back, you figure out that contract situation. I guess you get Pierce back. You need some kind of pass rushing presence. Present. You need some kind of pass rushing presence at D tackle. 
So let's let's reset that because I'm talking in circles here as we go. So you need the offensive line to figure itself out because you don't really have the resources to do it. Maybe you draft a guard, but you, you need to figure out the guard spot and have Ezra Cleveland work out at left tackle. So that alone is difficult. Then you need, with Michael Pierce coming back next year, you need some kind of a pass rushing D tackle. So whether that's Lynch stepping up at D tackle or Jalen Holmes or maybe you sign a guy for cheap but that's going to be tough you need some other edge presence which maybe dj want emerges as a quality starter and then you need basically this secondary you're probably going to lose harris by the way anthony harris so you need a safety you need the secondary to like you just need to become a dynamic dominant football team overnight if you want to win a super bowl with kirk cousins they can absolutely win 10, 11, 12 games again next year, make some noise. But to rely, to count on him to do what he needs to do and play at an elite level without an elite defense, without an elite offensive line, it's probably just not realistic. The odds of them doing that all are incredibly slim. Uh, that's just putting it blunt. The Vikings are very much in a state of not purgatory because they're an above average team, but you get the point. Like they are ahead of the game, but stuck in neutral. Let's put it that way. They need a lot to go right to be a Super Bowl team. Uh, Dino Skylark, is this where I send in mailbag questions? Yes. Let me just respond to that right now so I don't forget. Jack Brown. When I watch Trey Lance, I get really confused. Sometimes he looks like a better prime Cam Newton, and sometimes he looks like Mariota. Which comp would you give Lance, and how does he compare to other QBs? Uh, I'm going to punt this one into January, Jack. I'm just not comfortable answering draft questions when I have not divin in, dove, dived into the film quite yet. That's all going to come in due time starting in January uh, when the draft season really picks up. I'm full on NFL analysis until the, the season ends. Justin Oaks. I have a question, but I also have a story that isn't really a question but it's informative all right well we'll we'll trust you here oaks we're gonna read it we're gonna read your story to me loyalty is how his biggest flaw outside of drafting he refuses to cut cords with alshon and peters even though they don't even look like pro players right now more examples would be belichick with stefan gilmore or the texans with jj watt so my question is when does a gm need to know when to trade older declining players for the betterment betterment of the team also, I thought I'd tell you why Taysom Hill is starting over Winston. You heard this on the Ryan Rusillo podcast. Uh, so Peyton said that before Taysom's extension, they had a conversation where Hill said he wanted to be the next QB for the Saints, and so Peyton stuck to his word. Okay. So Peyton trusts Taysom Hill. All right, anyway, um, yeah, it's always tough with veterans to go back to your question on, like, when do you move on from a guy? You have to predict age regression, which doesn't always come for guys. So you're not always making the right answer. Um, but in Howie's situation, like, yeah, when you're pushed up against the cap and it's likely that a guy regresses, which I think is the case in the Texans situation with J.J. Watt, now, the Patriots have a lot more cap flexibility, so it might not necessarily be essential that they move on from Stephon Gilmore. Um, I think that's probably the biggest answer there is if you're going to use that cap elsewhere, like if you need that money and, and the guy's likely to regress, yeah, it makes sense to move on. So yeah, in Howie's situation, like with Alshon and Peters, like they would have been best using that money elsewhere. But if... If a guy is still going to be a factor for you, even if he regresses and you don't necessarily need the cap or the draft picks, like keep him around. Also in JJ Watt's situation, like the guy is just a franchise legend. It's just difficult to emotionally do that. Like Larry Fitzgerald for the Cardinals is another example. From Loomer Coomer, Loomer Cooper. I know you talked about it in an earlier video, but what are big reasons for Burrow over Murray 
do you also think Murray could potentially be better than Burrow? Yeah, that's um, that's a hundred percent what I said in the quarterbacks rankings was. Right now, Burrow, just, he's sharp, man. Burrow's going to show up. You know what? You're getting play to play. He extends plays. He's accurate. He's the like he is just Tom Brady, waist up. Aaron Rodgers, waist down. I'm not backing off of that. Like Burrow is just different the way he looks playing football. Murray is much more of a flash player. He needs to figure out the consistency stuff. Uh, I saw him on a play against the Rams. It was one of the first plays of the game. They ran a spot concept with... Um, or stick concept, whichever you want to call it, um, with Hopkins running as the lone receiver on the left side, running a hitch, and the running back running into the flat behind him. It was cover three, and both the buzz defender and the uh, outside third defender closed in on Hopkins, which meant the flat was coming wide open because either the outside third or the curl flat defender needs to go to the flats to the receiver so um what's his name the running back for for the cardinals sprints into the flat and if kyler saw that he flips it out floats it in front of him there's almost no one in front of him it could have been a huge play kenny and drake uh so it's just stuff like that that you see from kyler you're like that wasn't the right read like oh you there was another play late in the game where he um tried to spin out of a sack but the the edge guy, I think it was I think it was um, Winovich. It could have been someone else. But the edge guy was playing a contain, and Kyler tried to spin out of the pressure. He spun right into the contain. It's just little stuff that it's like you need to learn from that mistake. And when you see that situation again, you need to do it differently. Burrow has come in as a rookie, and like there just aren't those mistakes that you look at. There's very few plays in a game where you look at Burrow's tape and you're like. He's got to learn to do that differently. He's got to learn to do that differently. When you watch Kyler, you watch Herbert, you watch pretty much every young quarterback in the league, you walk away saying those things. But Burrow is just sharp, dude. He makes all the right decisions for the most part. And that's the difference. And Kyler 100% has a higher upside than Burrow, physically speaking. Absolutely. All right, from Connor Lee, which teams should consider a full rebuild as in a blow up. I I think the Jags have already done that, so not really. Um, the Jets getting Lawrence, that's not really a rebuild. But like Detroit and Chicago are the two teams I really look at. Chicago, like ownership would never go for that though. Like they aren't the Bears just aren't a team that's gonna trade away all the veterans and win one game next year. Um, other teams that should can, I think Detroit, absolutely. Like you got to blow it up. And I think that'd be the right decision for the bears, but they won't do that. Uh, other than that, AFC North, no AFC East, probably not just cause the jets are already kind of getting that number one pick AFC South t- Texans. It's not really a full tear down cause you already got the quarterback West. Uh, you know, Chargers, you can't really call it a full teardown because Herbert's not going anywhere. NFC North, we did that. NFC West, nobody. NFC South, Falcons, I think, would benefit from it. I just don't see them going anywhere with Matt Ryan and Julio at their age. I think they would benefit from a full teardown. Um, and then you've got you know, Eagles and Cowboys, I don't think they need to go full teardown. I don't think they're at that point quite yet, even with as bad as Wentz has played. Uh, so, yeah, Falcons, Lions, that's really it. That's really your list of, of blow-it-up types of uh, rebuilds. And then the Bears, if they could get over themselves. All right, for Matthew Bell, we got two more questions here. Do you think the Panthers made a mistake signing Teddy? I understand it from a cultural perspective, but I, I knew where you were going with this. It takes you out of the race to get Lawrence, maybe even Zach Wilson at this point, puts you in the verge of being stuck in QB purgatory. Yeah, I, I talked about this when they did it, uh, that it was, a, it was a concern of mine, and I'm very interested to see how the Panthers navigate it because they absolutely did that to themselves. They put themselves in a state of purgatory. We just talked about 
how tanking and blowing things up can be the best thing for your team because you get that quarterback. And Teddy Bridgewater is never going to win a Super Bowl unless everything goes absolutely perfectly. If you are that 1% of teams that just everything clicks. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. And it puts them in a spot where you got you either got to trade up, you got to do what the Chiefs did to go get Patrick Mahomes, what the Texans did to go get Deshaun Watson. You got to have that eye. Uh, I don't know if there's that quarterback this year or not. Maybe it's Trey Lance. I don't know. Um, but you might have to trade up for it. I just noticed I've got this, uh, this open right here in the background. Um, but yeah, they have to navigate it. It's not going to come to them. Maybe it's trading for Sam Darnold. Maybe it's trading for Carson Wentz and fixing them. I don't know. They're going to have to navigate it. I, was it a mistake to sign Teddy? Oh, man. I I don't know. I think they've established such a nice culture there that it's hard to say it's a mistake. I mean, other teams have shown pathways to get elite quarterbacks. It just takes being a little bold. I I don't think so. I think them winning is good for the culture there, and, and that still matters. And you found out you have a coach that you like too, so... I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but they did do that to themselves, and it's going to put them in a tough situation, but they can navigate it if they if they play their cards right. All right, last question here from Tyler. What do you look for in a college head coach to determine if they might become a quality NFL head coach? Who would be your top five NFL head coaching candidates? Well, we're good on that one. Oh, who currently work for college football teams? Uh, we talked about the Ohio State guy, Davil Sweeney. Uh, Lincoln Riley, I guess Nick Saban if he ever wanted to leave Alabama, but he wouldn't. And uh, just to be a homer for a second, I try not to be a homer, but just because we're having fun here, uh, how about P.J. Fleck, who's just awesome for Minnesota, uh, who's really fun. Now, probably a terrible answer there, but I really like P.J. Fleck, so I'm just going to throw that name in the ring. Pat, Pat Fitzgerald's another guy at Northwestern that people throw out there. Um, but as far as what you look for, Things that translate to the NFL, like do they develop players well? Do they ha- do they run schemes that would translate? Like if you're looking at a defensive guy, like I don't want you to run some crazy like college hybrid three three five that mainly works because of the wide hash marks. Like there's different parts of the college game that just don't translate. But um, I look for player development. I look for leadership, consistency, and a scheme that is would translate to the pros. So there you go. There's the podcast. Great episode, guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button. If you're watching the pod or listening to the podcast, leave a review and uh, consider signing up on Patreon to support the show and get exclusive content. That's going to do it. I appreciate you guys for watching. Cheers. We'll see you later. Peace out.